Hello, this is Dr. Overstreet, and I am the psychology professor and chair of the Department of Behavioral Sciences at Tarrant County College, and welcome to the Lifespan Growth and Development class for this semester. It's an online class, um, and so these PowerPoint presentations are actually designed to be supplements to the textbook, so you'll want to make sure you read all the information in the chapter, work the study guides, and then go to the PowerPoints for, uh, you know, what I would normally provide in the lectures. They do follow the chapter, though, so uh, you should see them as applications and additional information. Lifespan is the topic that covers human development from about seven generations before you're born, which uh, provides all of the genetic information, biological, for traits and predispositions, which are real important on that part of the spectrum. And then uh, we proceed through gestation, birth, the neonatal period, early and middle childhood, adolescence, early, middle and late adulthood, late life. And uh, that covers the entire lifespan. So uh, we're basing our information primarily on the peer review journals, which are the scientific journals. So this is a evidence-based approach to understanding development, which means that we rely on scientific method and information that we get from scientific studies. So we'll be talking a little bit about how uh, science applies to uh, human development. The, um, we also uh, I've kind of focused this class to basically relate to healthcare providers, people that plan on going into some kind of clinical face-to-face -face environment like um, nurses, physicians, uh, dental practitioners, um, physical therapists, uh, counselors, anybody that's going to be in that kind of environment where they're face-to-face. -face. But it also uh, can be valuable information if you're raising children or going into education or business uh, anytime you have to deal with people. And so uh, to help kind of gain some understanding and what are some of the factors that play into how a person turns out the way they are, make us understand the news a little bit better, hopefully. So those are the kind of, uh, that's kind of the, pro the, the approach I'm taking here. And uh, I, but one thing that I think is really important is looking at some of the anti-aging literature because uh, the relationship between aging and disease is a close one. And those are closely tied together. And so disease prevention is really heavily tied into anti-aging or, or things that slow down or uh, compensate for the aging process. So that's where we are. So uh, hope you have a really good semester. Don't forget to send me any questions that you have or feel free to call and uh, we'll proceed. Okay, when we uh, will begin here, we can look at Kind of how we can categorize all, categorize all the information that we're going to be looking at this semester. Um, you have really two sides to the equation here. Uh, the nature side is all the biological, genetics, physical appearance, uh, all the factors that uh, work themselves out uh, as, as we go through uh, the part of development that is growth and acquisition of skills and detail in uh, the structures and then uh, once we get to the sort of peak of development we begin the aging process and so the things on the biological or natural side nature side that determine how we age uh, is going to involve all those predispositions that we inherit from our ancestors the nurture side is going to have to do with all the environmental variables so we have parenting on this uh, and uh, social class and risk factors that are out in the environment. Um, take, for example, you know, Flint, Michigan problem and the lead in the water there. Uh, that's a, a, on the nurture side, a, a really dramatic kind of effect that it's having on a cohort of kids there that have been lead exposed at a very early age. Uh, that's an environmental influence. So that's, um, and so we can categorize all the things that come from the setting we're in, the context of our development, are coming from the nurture side. Now, these aren't mutually exclusive. They uh, 
operate in consort with each other, and that's called the interactionist approach. So the interactionist approach is how the environment affects the course of biological development. And so at the cellular level, that's referred to the epigenetic unfolding of this information. In other words, the environment affects how genes react and how they um, uh, affect how they they contribute to development. So uh, the word, so this is a complex interactive system between our biological predispositions and environmental factors. So now you can see here that we have um, a range of specific considerations running from nature to nurture. Example of placing some of these uh, issues or, or concentrations in the, the span from one to the other. The biological approach, of course, being on the far left, which is genetic, hormonal, neurochemical explanations of behavior and the very uh, specific sort of cellular and brain function parts of it when we're talking about psychological variables. And then um, we have also sort of towards the end of the nature side, the literature on that came originally from psychoanalysis, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. This is Sigmund Freud. And the whole idea of innate drives of sex and aggression and uh, the effect of direct contact with parents during upbringing. Um, and then when you get more in the middle here, you've got cognitive development, which is really heavily dependent on predispositions. That's your predisposition for what how intelligent somebody is or what their cognitive skills are going to be. But then again, cognitive development is, all, development is also heavily dependent on how rich the exposure is, especially early in childhood. So brain development and the manifestation of all these predispositions, like what your particular skills are going to be, are heavily dependent on early exposure. So we'll be talking about that later. Uh, you know, what makes a concert violinist? Basically, being exposed to music and violin at a very early age, probably before age five. That's what makes people exceptional when they have this very early exposure. So same thing is true for, co for basic cognitive skills. You know, very, uh, the, the kinds of, of environment that kids have when they're in a preschool, kindergarten or early elementary school are real critical for what happens to them later in life. That's why you'll notice school districts now have made, a few years ago, they made kindergarten part of the regular curriculum. Now they're talking about actually adding preschool and some school districts already have to the early childhood educational curriculum. And that would match what the literature tells us about cognitive development and early childhood. And this will relate to another concept we'll talk about a little later called neuroplasticity, which uh, is, uh, gets us far reaching into different uh, theoretical perspectives like how language develops and your ability to recover from brain damage and all kinds of things like that are all tied together under the heading of neuroplasticity. So we'll be talking more about, more about that uh, later. And then when you get into the nurture side, you're really talking about from Maslow's perspective, you know, how the environment is set up for people depending on what social class they're in or what their resources are and that's in the hierarchy of human needs and then at the far uh, end of the nurture spectrum we have the behaviorists which is very specific theoretical perspectives that have to do with how the environment shapes behavior and how we can account for behavior by looking at an analysis of environmental stimulating contingencies and we'll put some time into discussing behaviorism because it's not discussed so much in the chapter, but there are a lot of very useful tools uh, from the behaviorists like the Pavlovians, the Skinnerians, the Bandura, those in the Rotter, those are all very important theorists and that's really uh, easily applied. So if you're a school teacher or a parent or a psychotherapist or a physician or a nurse and you're dealing with people and how their behavior is affecting their health or their development or how well they do in school or their ability to uh, be successful and socialize. Those are all of the things that uh, the behaviors have something to say about. So we'll be talking much more, more about that later.
Just want to revisit an idea here for a second and sort of give some I, some emphasis on why this is important. But looking at genetics and socialization in the interactive approach or the epigenetics of how we turn out, uh, when you put this in application, it's uh, let's for example in a medical setting, uh, it's important to understand that the biology or in medicine, you know, the symptom uh, diagnostics uh, that and uh, how a person acquired a certain syndrome or in understanding what their prognosis is a lot. There's a lot of uh, it's important to look at the social aspect, the, the social factors like where this person is in their social class and their life and their culture, uh, how they were socialized, uh, because behavior patterns actually have a lot to do with even for the disease risk and they also have a lot to do with the prognosis for recovery. So when you look at the uh, health promotion literature, there's an area in that called behavioral medicine and that is when you spend a lot and health psychology, which is when you spend time looking at what kind of changes can be made, uh, say in early childhood to reduce the risk for uh, disease or problems later on, um, uh, things that challenge the ability to be successful and healthy. Um, and th those become really important factors when you're looking at it from a health psychology perspective, which is a lot different than the disease model where you just wait for the disease to happen and then actually just treat the symptoms and not really worry about how uh, that person's going to, you know, the other factors that are contributing to the disease, because you can have a disease maintaining process that does not get addressed and you wind up with just a, a chronic kind of condition. So the topics that you find in this uh, area are things like uh, the risk for type 2 diabetes, consequences of clinical obesity in children. And uh, so those are some of the factors we're going to be looking at as we go through uh, this interactive approach. Okay, on the biological side of the equation, the nature part of the nature versus nurture debate, we have the aging process at the cellular level. Senescence is cellular aging. So these are, uh, it's the accumulation of all the factors that determine uh, the maintenance of the regenerative process of the, at the of cells or at the cellular level. So <clears throat> The, the better cellular maintenance of regeneration is maintained, the delay, that causes a delay in the aging process. So aging is advanced by a, an increase in cell death and cell dysfunction. So cell dysfunction can result in things like cancer uh, and um, uh, other sources of inflammation. So. Uh, the main thing here is uh, the, the, that's in the anti-aging literature when you really look at uh, tissue aging or cellular level aging is the role of inflammation and the input factors that can increase in, uh, inflammation and make it chronic. And uh, you can see that on this diagram and the epigenetic factors includes all the kinds of factors that affect cells. And then you've got a DNA damage that some of that can come from environmental factors like certain toxins in the environment, sun exposure, uh, things like that can, uh, from the environment can actually result in DNA damage. The telomeres are the uh, little subgroups at the end of the arms of the chromosomes that tell the cell or uh, to maintain its ability to reproduce. Telomeres generally tend to get shorter as people age and eventually the cell dies because telomeric action and telomerase um, fail in the maintenance of the cell. Uh, that is pr probably primarily a biological predisposition. Some people just age faster than others. Some people uh, in certain parts of the world live longer than others, but it's really hard to separate out the purely predisposed biological factors with the environmental factors because there's so much interaction between the two. So uh, you have regular stem cell exhaustion. Stem cells are uh, 
the cells that are undifferentiated tissue cells that become uh, and sort of the reparative process they become the cells in different parts of the body as you have cell damage the main takeaway from all this is basically the role of inflammation so heart disease uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD uh, certain kinds of cancer uh, arthritis uh, and uh, th things that uh, cause our uh, conditions that result from and cause autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis Crohn's disease things like that the, the main central role in all of these things is inflammation so if inflammation levels are high the person tends to age longer uh, faster and uh, with it you see declines in their health so one central focus now in uh, health psychology and in health promotion in medicine is to focus on the prevention of inflammation and all of the ways that you can do that and we'll be talking about that more later on there's some uh, new science out uh, that's really looking at restrictive calorie diets and some things like that and how that can help with inflammation Here's some sort of uh, specific epigenetic factors um, has to do with uh, what we've already talked about a bit, but diet, uh, certain types of drug abuse can uh, be profound advancers of age and inflammation and disease. Um, the most common are probably alcohol and stimulants. Um, other toxic chemicals like cigarette smoking certainly advances aging in a variety of ways. Uh, cigarette smoking, causes a dramatic inflammatory response in the mediastinum or the, or the chest part of the body where the coronary arteries are the heart the lungs uh, and the major um, vessels it causes a lot of inflammation in that area of the body and that's why people get so sick with uh, uh, smoking uh, um, and so uh, and then there's uh, some factors like uh, how established or consistent a person's social environment is and how much social support they get uh, how generally happy they are in their social relationships and things like that you find correlational data that looks at uh, you know let's say uh, people that live in a tight nuclear family system and people that don't and uh, the isolation and its effects uh, especially in older people and the effects that that has on their biology and also finally uh, exercise uh, moderate low low stress exercise on a regular basis uh, there's profound uh, effects that come from the evidence looking at people that are active and uh, like even in comparing people for example that live in zones where uh, some of these are called blue zones where they have mass transit and uh, Paradoxically, people tend to walk a lot more when they're in mass transit communities, and uh, we have lower rates of heart disease and COPD in those communities. So just the structure of society can have a dramatic effect on the general health of every, everyone in that society. Preventative medicine and uh, ready access to primary care also has dramatic effects on disease and the rate of aging in a population as uh, the, the, because of the fact that you can detect and address um, inflammatory conditions much earlier in the process before they have a an opportunity to become chronic what's important here is really some of these things we've talked about aging and inflammation you can look uh, at the systems that are involved here on the nervous system the musculoskeletal system pulmonary system digestive system the risk for cancer and cardiometabolic problems but but Gut by, uh, dysbiosis has become a interesting topic now in nutrition and health promotion. And what that is, is that's really looking at what's called our microbiome or, or the uh, biological, the bacterial um, uh, flora in our gut. And so there's been a lot of uh, some more recent studies uh, looking at how things like artificial sweeteners and uh, corn syrup and uh, certain uh, whole wheat and certain things that affect our gut microbiome and they're starting to look at uh, 
the kinds of consequences that you see as a result of that as far as the aging process. And you can actually see a correlation between chronic inflammation and inflammatory conditions and the condition of the gut microbiome. So um, now um, there's a cardiovascular surgeon named Stephen Gundry that's written a lot about this in, um, and many, many other authors are in the medical community. Interesting, many of them vascular people or cardiologists that have looked at the gut microbiome and how it affects the risk for heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and other things that can advance aging at a really rapid rate. So as a healthcare professional or a trainer or uh, someone that's raising children uh, or someone that's helping uh, take care of other people in their family or any kind of face-to-face -face, um, assistance that, that uh, one person has for another, the, the, there are uh, several practices that and, and focus that can really help reduce the probability of disease and, and, and slow down the aging process. Um, the, what's been recently discovered is that there may be some paradigm shifts going on in the nutritional literature about the use of whole wheats, legumes, and uh, foods that have what are called lectins, and uh, the effect those have on the gut microbiome. It's been so, uh, there's been some studies eliminating those things and uh, seeing pretty dramatic results in people that suffer from irritable bowel syndrome and uh, other kinds of inflammatory conditions. So with regard to health promotion, there's a few things on the social or structural level that are important. Um, the mo uh, entry into the healthcare system and primary care and the ability to fund um, preventative practices and consultations about diet, uh, nutrition, things like that. Um, uh, the whole idea is to set up changes in bad habits at an early age before they lead to inflammatory processes or disease processes later, um, rather than waiting until you see a, a disease pattern or sickle of symptoms before you intervene. That's called the old disease model. It's uh, inefficient. Unfortunately, our system primarily reinforces mostly disease model practice. Um, insurance companies limit your access to health care until you have symptoms, uh, and so um, many of them don't have structures for getting people to uh, look at what may be coming on down the road, you know, the practices now that could result in big problems later on. Also, it's interesting in the, in the disease prevention literature and anti-aging literature that uh, the earlier the healthy habits uh, begin, the more beneficial they tend to be, which is interesting. So someone that's had healthy practices, you can see in some parts of the world, like the Asian world, uh, where people have had real healthy diets, you know, uh, with lots of uh, the right kinds of oils and uh, non-saturated fats and uh, mostly vegetables and not much in the way of, of uh, animal protein. Uh, that, and this starts at a very, very early age, you find that they actually have much longer lifespans and they live uh, deep into their late life with no medical intervention, many of them a lifetime of uh, freedom from any kind of medical intervention. So you don't see much chronic disease in those groups. They also happen to be societies where the primary mode of transportation is either bicycle or on foot. And so they're uh, generally active on a daily basis and don't spend a lot of time in periods of inactivity. Where you see in the world where there's our increased uh, inactivity, uh, cars, for example, are a real source of inactivity. Air conditioning, for example, is a real source of inactivity. And that has uh, generated uh, more chronic illness and inflammation in those areas. It's interesting that in the south of the United States, you have much higher rates of heart disease, type 2 diabetes, clinical obesity, as opposed to the northern western region or northern eastern region, where you have lots of cold weather and uh, snow, but you also have a lot of mass transit, and uh, people are just generally more active on a daily basis. 
So uh, real good medical practice, sort of an adage is that a person should plan for their best 70th birthday. That they should think in those terms early in life because they want to be ripping and roaring and, and having a, a lot of uh, resilience when they get to their 70th birthday for that last phase of life since you have to spend it, uh, you know, uh, going to the, the doctor and having to have a lot of medications and, and a, a big demand on health care. About 80 percent of your total health care that you'll ever use in your whole life is consumed in the very last few months of life. Here's an example of a book I was talking about. This is Stephen Gundry. Uh, he's a cardiovascular surgeon that began to do some research in uh, basically in the, the plant literature and discovered some interesting things and, and started applying them to his own patients. And he gives, this is a, a, a book called The Longevity Paradox, which introduces some of those ideas that he has uh, uh, used with his patients in his practice. And he has uh, very specific stories to tell in here about some of the progress he made in patients with chronic illness, including heart disease, and some of the success successes he had when he put them on the intensive care diet. So um, this is a uh, paradigm of preventative medicine that works quite nicely for nurse practitioners or anybody in primary care that's dealing with patients who uh, have uh, chronic illness or people you know, that are not sick yet. And, but you can kind of see it coming. So uh, Gundry's a, a good one. There's other books like this, by the way. So what we basically have is biopsychosocial approach to health and aging. And it takes in uh, these three domains that overlap in the middle uh, to give you the total health picture. Interestingly enough, when we do psychological assessments, the, the history we get is called a biopsychosocial history. And it takes into account these three domains, including their medical history, any biological factors like things like uh, conditions they could have inherited, other things that can kind of affect their functionality. Uh, and, uh, and then there's the social context. That's uh, the structures they live in, their family, their society, their social class. All of those things have correlates with how generally healthy and happy they are and how, uh, what the opportunities for the children are to grow up in a healthy environment. And then the psychological factors are the more uh, specific uh, um, domains under psychology like personality, behaviors, emotion, coping skills, uh, resiliency should be in their actual psychological resilience and uh, learning, which we'll talk about in a minute, attitudes and beliefs. And so uh, you can see how attitudes, belief, personality variables can have a pretty dramatic effect on some of these other things like how someone deals with their uh, risk factors. You know, you have a long history of lung cancer in your family and a long history of smokers in your family. Your attitudes and beliefs and personality variables around uh, smoking can have a lot to do with whether a person chooses to take that risk, uh, even given that they may have a biological predisposition to have a pretty dramatic uh, negative outcome on that. So when talking about learning, we're going to... Um, do a little background on learning theory and some of the uh, theories that you got into in your general psychology class that's not really addressed as much in this book, which it really should be. So we're going to take a little time and go into what's relevant about Pavlov and Skinner and Operant the uh, theory and Pav uh, Bandura and social learning theory and Rotter and Locus control theory. Those are some really important things to keep in mind when we look at the nurture side of development. So uh, we'll be addressing those. Just as a reminder here, and a little bit of a review, uh, a couple of terms, uh, genetic traits and predispositions. Uh, the genotype is the actual presence of the genes, genes sequenced on the chromosome, passed down uh, at fertilization. And the phenotype is the observable trait that you find or a measurable trait uh, that you uh, find as a result of the genotype. And the more we learn about genetics, the more we can see that genes respond to environmental factors. Uh, we, don't, we are absolutely, actually not completely familiar with all the ways this happens, but some 
processes that previously were believed to be fixed may not so much be fixed that even though you may have a certain predisposition, our, gene, our genetic makeup tends to get signals from the environment that affect um, things like lifespan and risk for certain things and uh, skills and abilities. So we can kind of see that in looking at uh, the way and differences in how people are raised and what kind of resources they have and how those get manifested in function later on in life. Okay, in your general psychology class, you probably had, or your anatomy and physiology class, if you've had one of those, you've, you had some neurophysiology. So you probably looked at the uh, brain cell or neuron and um, the functionality of the neuron and the structures of the nervous system uh, as just part of an introduction to, to how the nervous system works in the body. Um, the nervous system is extremely complex. There's actually a, in the five course pre-medical, I mean, uh, medical school curriculum, uh, one of the courses is neuroanatomy and physiology and is an extremely complicated class. Um, I did research in brain structure function and uh, it was a lesson in how incredibly complicated the brain can be. But the factors that are most relevant to us have to do with the um, way the neurons communicate with each other and the growth of myelin on the axon of the neurons. So uh, the uh, development, the developmental prerequisite biologically is actually the way, you know, the density of connections from one neuron to another, to the other neurons in the brain, the matrix, the lattice that gets laid down as the neurons develop new correction, connections with uh, exposure to environmental stimuli, and uh, the growth of myelin, which is the glia cells that insulate the axon and speed up the functionality of the neuron. The infant or neonate's brain is actually, um, doesn't have a, a lot of myelin in it. There's two things that determine whether neurons are going to be myelate, myelinated. One is, is it, necess is it in a neurotract that's necessary for survival, like in the brain stem, where you have to have uh, breathing and heart rate, uh, vasodilation and constriction to maintain blood pressure and other factors like that? Uh, or is it uh, supporting a system that's critical for survival, like sense of smell, sense of taste, sense of touch, or pain? Uh, so, if, so if there's a genetic predisposition for myelin on a neurotract because, and those cells have to be operating and those nerves have to be firing because that's critical for survival, then they're going to myelinate before birth and you're going to see full functionality at birth. If they're not critical for survival, they may require some kind of stimulation from the environment uh, and like vision. And in that case, environmental stimulation will cause them the uh, axons of those neurons in those neurotracts to myelinate. So myelination is the development of a myelin sheath around the axon of the nerve that insulates the uh, electrochemical action in there and speeds up the action potential or firing of that neuron. Before myelination, the neuron is slow. And there are some uh, neurons in the body that are uh, designed to be slower, like the ones in your spinal cord. But the ones in the brain are generally myelinated. And so as the neurons myelinate, you get functionality in those neurotracts and uh, not until then. Now, myelin is actually uh, made up of triglyceride, which comes from dietary fats. And so uh, it's a, that's why a certain amount of dietary fat is critical for the ability of myelination in the brain. So um, now, uh, children that are deprived of dietary fat very early in life, like in places where they have problems with nutrients, uh, and starvation, uh, those kids uh, can be greatly negatively impacted. Their, their ability to develop can be significantly impacted uh, negatively. So uh, the other um, consideration is, is the critical period. So myelination, critical period is, uh, bur is to some degree before birth and late gestation all the way through the fifth year until they're five years old. By the time they're five years old, the brain's about 90% myelinated. 
uh, and uh, so you'll have functionality in most parts of the brain. So the way grow myelin grows on the, on the axon is, like I said, it's either there because the axon, the neuron, that neuron is part of a neuropathway that, that needs to be functional for survival, like sense of smell. So the question is, why is sense of smell um, necessary for survival? And it's because that is a warning sign for you. And you'll notice that um, things that smell bad are real repulsive, may even make you nauseous. Uh, that's a defense mechanism, protects babies from taking in things that taste bad or smell bad. Uh, and uh, so immature neurons don't have myelin and they're very slow in their function. And as a result, the neural pathway they're part of is not going to be functional yet. So the occipital lobe in, in the infant's brain at birth has very little myelin in it. And so they don't see a lot at birth, although their auditory tract is myelinated at birth in the temporal lobes. Uh, the question is, why is that? Well, it tells us one thing. For, well, first of all, it tells you that there's sound in the amnion, okay, during uh, gestation, in the latter part of the gestation, there's actually sound coming in through the belly wall, and that stimulates the auditory nerves to myelinate, and then so you get myelination of the neuro tracts in the um, auditory tract. There's nothing, there's no visual stimulus in the amnion, and the fact that babies are born without visual, sim, without vis, vision, or much vision, and non-myelinated neural pathways in the visual cortex and the occipital lobes, uh, that tells you right there that vision is actually not critical for survival at birth. It's not a predisposed process. It requires stimulation. So um, they, uh, exposure to light uh, stimulates that. And that's what brings about visual function in the brain. Babies don't have myelin in their motor cortex, so they don't have voluntary movement. The movements that you see in newborn babies are all reflex arc movements up and down the spinal cord. Uh, they have a sucking uh, um, reflex. We'll talk about reflexes a little later, but um, they, uh, there's uh, not voluntary movement there, not until the motor cortex and the basal ganglia and the cerebellum all myelinate that pathway that allows us to choose our behaviors. Sleep is really important for, uh, in a discussion of myelination in infants because it's, it's interesting the way myelin uh, grows in the infant brain. And that is, is the, the general tra uh, process here is progressing from general to specific. So it's a little bit like an artist who paints their canvas in the hue they want the general painting to look like before they start their painting. So they may take a big brush and paint the whole canvas one color to kind of set the hue before they start adding the detail. And that's kind of what infant sleeping does. Infants sleep a good portion of the time, um, 60 something, 60 to 80 percent of the time they're asleep. When they sleep, they sleep a great deal more uh, eye, rapid eye movement sleep than adults do or children later in life. Um, our rapid eye movement sleep is a real active form of sleep in the brain. Uh, you may remember from your general psych class that there's a sleep cycle that involves delta wave sleep to REM sleep, and then the cycle goes on through the night as REM sleep periods get longer and delta wave sleep get, periods get shorter in the morning. And infants, they immediately go into REM sleep and they have long REM sleep periods as the night progresses. Delta wave sleep periods are when human growth hormones secreted. During REM sleep, though, their impulses go up through the brain uh, in a kind of an activation synthesis style all the way through the brain. And those generalized stimulations cause the growth of myelin indiscriminately on all the neurons in the brain. So that lays down this kind of general um, functionality in the brain with no specificity yet. So it's very inefficient, actually. Uh, it also stimulates neuron connections, you know, uh, a lattice of neurons as they connect to each other through this stimulation, and signals back and forth through the neuro, for the through the neurons in the brain. But again, there's no not, not many specific neural pathways to give it um, efficient functionality. But what happens is is, is as um, infants interact with the environment, as they're exposed to vision to visual stimulation, as they're stimulated to move in certain ways, uh, 
uh, and they start to develop, then the neural pathways begin to prune off the unnecessary connections because the connections that are used or utilized continue to be maintained and the ones that are not utilized tend to be pruned away as unnecessary. That pruning results in the formation of neurotracts in the brain, and that's what gives you kind of a circuit board pattern that uh, makes the, the processing in the brain much, much more efficient. And so the general trend is to go from, from the, the trend in myelination in the brain is, and development of the brain is to go from general to specific. Now, one of the trends that's important uh, to keep in mind is, uh, and this is an embryological term actually, in embryology, the embryo develops from head to tail. It's called cephalocaudal development. You'll notice that babies have gigantic heads and little bitty bodies. So do puppies. We think that looks cute. And the reason we think it looks cute is because we want to take care of them when they look like that. And that's what helps them survive. So we like puppies and kittens and little babies. Uh, and they have that look. Great big head, little bitty body. And uh, what you're going to see with development is a shift over time from uh, the size of the head relative to the body to a more distributive um, proportionality between the head and the body. You also see development of function starting at the top and proceeding down. Like they get functionality over the uh, cephalic part of the body before they get it over the caudal part. Uh, the, the lower part. For example, infants get are born with quite a bit of control over blinking and eyes uh, you, uh, as soon as they start to get their visual system. And then, then uh, we'll talk about in a minute, the, the reflexes can kind of be organized that way. So they start to get control over the upper part of the body first. Infants get control over their uh, facial and head movements before they do over their arms and hands. And then they get control over their arms and hands before they get control over their uh, feet. That's why most uh, infants will pull up, crawl with their, their arms first, and then later on, you know, crawl with their feet. In fact, you can kind of see this trend in crawling. They'll uh, at first sort of move like an earthworm uh, like, for example, they can roll over by just tossing that big old head over and the body kind of flops over after it. Uh, they can raise up with their core muscles along their spinal cord and, and set up on their elbows. And then eventually they'll tuck their knees under them and kind of launch themselves off. Then you alternate arms, then alternate legs, and they'll start to pull themselves up and stand erect. And uh, so that's, that's uh, one of the trends. The other trend is the proximal distal trend. And this is uh, from the midline of the body out to the, the uh, extremities. So you'll see control over the midline of the body first, like being able to arch their back, uh, being able to stand with all their larger muscles towards the center uh, axis of the body. And they also start to get control over those muscles first before they get control over the extremities. Like for example, babies will grasp with their palm and wrap their fingers around an object before they can grasp with their fingers. So they go from a palmer grasp to a pincer grasp. Palmer grasp to pincer grasp is a proximal distal trend. Uh, being able to stand up with gross muscles, and if you look at them when they're still, they'll like grab a couch cushion and pull themselves up, and then kind of stand there. And if you look at them, you know, their little toes are trying to find the floor. Uh, it takes development in their fine motor uh, proprioceptors in, or kinesthetic senses in their feet to really be able to get to where they can balance and walk. So actually balancing and walking, being bipedal like that, uh, is a fine motor uh, task. Uh, and gross standing is a gross motor task. So that sets up another trend. So proximal distal development and cephalocaudal development both follow a uh, gross to fine general trend. Gross first, and then eventually fine. Okay, now let's uh, let's look at some learning theory because 
Uh, learning is really important for understanding the nurture side of the nature versus nurture debate. This is where a lot of our tools come from. I mean, this is this is what we look at when we look at education, parenting, uh, and uh, a lot of our uh, actual techniques come from understanding learning theory. And uh, and the science of learning theory gave us a lot of information. It's not always that intuitive, which we'll talk about in a minute. Sometimes things are not the way they appear when we get into the research and really start looking at what's going on in the learning process. But first, let's look at what learning is. You know, in psychology, learning is the general term is that learning is any uh, change in an organism resulting from exposure to a stimulus. So even changes in your reflexive responses to repeated stimuli, um, that, that's a learning process. And, uh, you know, uh, learn, uh, ma uh, relaxation or learning to master your blood pressure or anything like that are all learned processes. That, even processes where you don't know what's happening, like associating positive or negative things to where they change how you respond. That's a learning process. It may not be at your level of awareness. So we use a very general kind of definition for the word learning in psychology okay so learning can occur at or below the level of awareness and we talk we'll talk about a little brain structure function here in a little bit to kind of look at that cortical learning is whenever cognition and reasoning is at their level of awareness this is when this is what we traditionally think of as thinking okay thinking uh, is um, cognition Cerebellar learning happens in the back of the brain in the area called the cerebellum. The cerebellum is called the little brain. It's, it lies in the uh, posterior part of the brain underneath the, uh, the occipital lobe. It's real distinct. You can see it. And that's where motor skills are stored. That's repetitive tasks or what we call muscle memory. And uh, it's also where conditioning takes place, like... Um, being operantly conditioned in a way, like behavior getting stronger because you're being reinforced for it, or uh, classical conditioning situations where you're pairing an aversive stimulus with a certain aversive uh, feeling or uh, with, a, with a certain stimulus, and that causes a change in how you respond to that stimulus. That happens, that can happen at below our level of awareness. Uh, driving a car uh, becomes muscle memory after a while. It's actually your cerebellum that does most of the driving, and you just uh, adjust based on some factors that you detect in the environment that, you know, even something as complicated as driving a car can become relatively automatic if you've done it enough. And that's because our brain's kind of rigged up so that we don't really need to pay attention to repeated tasks over and over and over again. Eventually, the brain takes that task out of consciousness and parks it in the rear where it can run in the background, and then you can devote your cortical uh, processes to adjusting or expressing or uh, other things like that. So it's a really handy way to have some cache memory like a computer does and sets aside that functionality. Um, so um, now, how do we know babies are predisposed to learn? Because we can test them. Like, for example, if you expose a baby to a repeated stimulus, their response to that stimulus is like startling or something like that decreases as it does for uh, adults okay and that's called habituation so when you can see a habituated response that's actually uh, a sign of learning the opposite of that is sensitization when a response increases with repeated exposure so certain kinds of stimuli can actually um, you can see an increase in sensitivity and that's another example of learning I'm not going to go through all the learning theories that you went through in your general psychology class, uh, but let's look at the ones that are going to be the most relevant that we want to review now, because again, your book really doesn't have a treatment of this like it should. Uh, there really should be more of an emphasis on the learning theorists and how that applies to development, because children are parented and they go to school and they're affected by the environment. So on the on the nurture side and the nature versus divert, nurture debate this is really important so uh, let's just uh, review for just a second here we have uh, basically the uh, hierarchy of learning theorists so 
I'm Pavlov, John B. Watson, Edward Thorndike, B.F. Skinner, Albert Bandura, and Julian Rotter uh, are Pavlov, Watson, Thorndike, Skinner, Bandura, and Rotter are, this is the sequence. This is, they actually uh, pretty much were developed in this order. And uh, Pavlov uh, will, becomes really relevant because he's really the first. And as you probably studied before, Pavlov wasn't even, there was no psychology at the time of Pavlov. And he was not interested at all in psychology once it came along. He didn't want to publish in psychology. He was actually a physiologist and a really famous one at that. And, uh, but he accidentally discovered the process of classical conditioning and launched behaviorism. So um, he didn't know he was doing that. And, uh, but he, uh, his findings became extremely important. And what Pavlov actually discovered, we'll talk about in a minute. So, and then Watson, we're not going to really get into much except to point out that since Pavlov wasn't interested in psychology and did not want to um, publish in psychology at the time, John B. Watson brought Pavlov into psychology by, by formulating Pavlov's classical conditioning theory as behaviorism. He formed the term behaviorism and he tested this on uh, humans and launched uh, uh, classical conditioning into work with humans and advocated for a scientific study of psychology based on the principles of classical conditioning. Uh, Thorndike is important here only because he adds a component to Watson, and that is Thorndike uh, looked at the law of effect or consequences. And basically, by working with cats and small animals, he found that whenever a behavior result in a positive outcome, that behavior tended to get stronger, and he called that the law of effect. The reason that's important is because B.F. Skinner, he takes what uh, Pavlov and Watson are looking at, and he takes what Thorndike's looking at, and he forms sort of a general theory called operant theory. Now, he didn't totally agree with Pavlov or Watson, uh, but he did incorporate their ideas and Thorndike uh, into operant theory. So we'll be talking about operant theory. Now, by the way, you have in your study supplements a document called behavior, um, behavior Analysis, and that's a, a flow chart, system of flow charts that I created for my general psych class that makes it easy just to, at, at a glance to see how these models work. So I'd recommend that you pull that up and print it off so that you can kind of look at that, especially in the relevant areas we're going to look we're going to go into here because these these things are too important to ignore. So behaviors model behavior uh, Skinner's behavioral model is called operant theory or behavior analysis. It's also called applied behavior analysis in areas in the clinical world. Uh, it's also called behavioral modification more in the lay world, you know, uh, in the parenting literature and all that. It's behavior modification. Skinner is really relevant in psychology because he revolutionized psychology. He brought it out of Freudian psychoanalysis. And he incorporated these ideas of behaviorism into a model that could be used in a variety of settings like the workplace, the school, the clinical world. And so by uh, the, basically by the 50s and 60s, Skinner was, Skinnerian behavior analysis just took over psychology. And it was really a dominant theory all the way up into the late 70s, early 80s. And so then comes Bandura, and we'll talk about Bandura quite a bit, but Albert Bandura was important because he added cognition to Skinner. Bandura and Skinner had real intense debates about this because Skinner didn't agree with using internal events like cognition or emotion in his explanation of behavioral processes. Bandura, though, did think that was really important. So he launches psychology into cognitive behaviorism, and that becomes really important because that's where we are now. So Skinner said that reinforcers strengthen behavior. Bandura said that the expectation of reinforcers can strengthen behavior. And so expectation is a cognitive variable. And so that's what really broadened the whole operant idea out into a much more important model, even though the opera model was really important. And then Julian Rotter, finally, he takes Bandura and Skinner and he develops this idea called locus of control that looks at efficacy. And locus of control is the idea that some people believe that they, or sense that they have lots of control over contingencies in the environment, environmental variables, control over their lives, or have lots of confidence. He calls those people internals. Other people, on the other hand, 
have very little confidence, tend to be more reactors to the environment, tend to be more um, impulsive, and so their efficacy is relatively low, and he calls those people externals. So that's his application of cognitive behaviorism. Okay, let's just look at a couple of theories here. Ivan Pavlov, John B. Watson. Um, Ivan Pavlov, uh, if you remember right, he's the one that accidentally discovered, it's called serendipity when you have an accidental discovery. He discovered in an experiment looking at gastronomic responses in mammals, in this case a dog, uh, he discovered the, that when the dog, um, if you remember right, he the dog um, forms a connection between the sound of a bell and the presentation of meat powder and Plavdol didn't predict that would happen. And the dog started, when, when those two th things were presented together, the bell was on a timer, uh, the dog could hear the timer, Pavlov didn't think about that. And what happened was, is that he was trying to look at, um, you know, the uh, time it had been since the dog had, ate, had eaten and how much saliva the dog would produce. What happened, though, in his experiment is, is that the dog began to salivate to the sound of the bell and it was paired with the meat, and that caused uh, the dog to be classically conditioned. So Pavlov uh, wrote about that, wrote up an article of it, and actually did some experimentation with classical, what he labeled classical conditioning, which is, in his world, uh, an explanation for how the environment was affecting the dog's responses or their reflexive responses to stimuli. That turned out to be extremely important because it was the first time that anyone had ever experimentally demonstrated the effect of an environmental stimulus on a behavior. So that got picked up by John B. Watson several years later, by the way, because Pavlov discovered this long before Watson was around. But Watson was really looking for more of a science of psychology at the time. Uh, Freud was real uh, popular at that point. And Watson is the one that took the past, found the Pavlovian model, and he uh, began to experiment with it with humans. So he had a little child named uh, Little Albert. Little Albert was a toddler, put him in a high chair, uh, and he kind of snuck up behind him, put a bunny rabbit in, in front of him, and then made a real loud noise with an iron bar and a hammer behind him and scared him. He repeated that pairing, stimulus pairing, over and over again until little Albert would cry at the sight of a bunny rabbit, which was the little furry animal he put in front of him. And John B. Watson was demonstrating at that point that little Albert had developed a conditioned aversion to the animal because it had been frightened uh, with presentation of the animal. And then uh, there's a process called extinction where you can remove the sound, present the animal over and over again until the behavior gets extinguished and it goes back to normal. Pavlov had discovered that in his laboratory studies. So what's the relevance of classical conditioning? When you're looking at stimulus pairings in the environment and how those can affect behavior, it becomes a really powerful tool for understanding how the environment uh, affects internal states like emotions and reflexive actions and things like that. So there are lots of practical applications of classical conditioning, and they are, it's actually at the core of a lot of clinical considerations. So, but it's also, you can look at it as a beneficial understanding for how you can ad make adjustments in the environment to actually influence how people respond to that environment without any awareness of what's going on. And so if you're a school teacher, you can be thinking about this, or uh, it leads to um, a lot of technique for getting desired outcomes. For example, let's say you're teaching a class, it's third grade, and your goal for your kids coming to school is you want them to learn something. They'll learn more if they enjoy being there than if, they do, if they're bored and don't enjoy being there. So as a teacher, you could think about, well, what kinds of things can I introduce into this environment that's going to create this kind of positive affect? That's an affect is an emotional state. So they, this kind of positive affect of the kids without them actually even realizing that's what's going on. Like they don't walk in the room and notice, oh, wow, this is, you know, got really nice windows and it's got a lot of daylight and it smells good and what a pleasant place. Uh, 
They may not even know that's going on, but while you're engaged in the educational tasks, what the environment is like is very important. What's even more important is to look at the possible aversions in the environment. Like what is school phobia? Well, school phobia is a condition where kids have an aver a, a classically conditioned aversion to go into school. So they'll have a very, very intense aversion and fight like crazy not to have to go to school and so then the task is to look at from a, an opera, from a classical conditioning perspective, what happened? Why are they afraid to go to school? So typically what a behavior analyst will do is start to examine uh, what happened when they were at school. So what you find in school phobia cases or when kids have a condition aversion to school is that they've been humiliated in front of other kids, which is you know a problem that you have to be careful of whenever you get kids that are transition from second to third grade, they become much more socially sensitive to their image, things like that. Uh, humiliation is a, not a good practice for kids that age especially, but kids in general, because they, humiliation can lead to a real strong uh, aversive response, and that can get you that classically conditioned aversion that you don't want. Uh, and uh, other things that can create conditioned aversions are things like bullies. Uh, it's common for bullies to to, for kids that are bullied to develop a conditioned aversion to not only the bully, but the school, because they're in that environment when they get bullied. Uh, getting sick at school may do it, you know, being nauseous or feeling bad or uh, getting sick at school can sometimes cause kids to form that connection of pairing the school with the illness, and that can create a conditioned aversion. So uh, when that happens, that's a, a uh, consi uh, acquired conditioned response. Uh, so what this does is it gives you quite a few tools if you think about it. A teacher can on purpose create an environment that has a lot of pleasant stimuli that they can um, that they can pair with the uh, with the the educational setting. And keep in mind that when you feel pleasure, it's because your brain is releasing dopamine, and dopamine is in the pleasure centers in the brain. And well, interestingly enough, when you laugh, you also release dopamine. So kids like to laugh. That's why when they're playing, they'll look for reasons to laugh. And so that's why comedy is so uh, such a motivator in kids. Of course, it's a motivator in all of us, but it's a motivator because you get any group of people with friends together. It's not going to be long before they're finding some way or reason to tell a funny story or to laugh about something because you release dopamine when you laugh, and that's a natural reinforcer. So if a teacher's aware of that, they can also introduce humor and entertaining kinds of things. Kids love stories, so uh, entertaining stories paired with the setting. Um, you'll notice that whenever you're immersed in a, a story, uh, time tends to go away. So, uh, so those are just some examples of things. Avoid humiliation, try to avoid punishers when possible, Use uh, you know affection, intrinsic reinforcement, eye contact, uh, pleasant smells like you know cookies, things like that. Real estate agents, you know, they'll tell you cook brownies when you show your house. Now, people aren't going to go in there and go, hey, this house smells like brownies. I'm going to buy that house, but because they don't even know what's going on, all they know is, is I don't know why, but I kind of like that house. You know, well, a brownie may not cause them to buy the house, but it may influence their affect when they're in the house. So that's a, a classically conditioned process. So here's some clear, clinical re, clinically relevant examples of classically conditioned um, aversions and fears, like kids being bit by a dog and then being beginning to have bouts of anxiety whenever they see a dog. I've seen kids, you know, in the clinical setting that had an aversion to even seeing dogs on TV or pictures of dogs because they'd been uh, I had one kid, for example, that I saw in the emergency room, saw in the emergency room and then was referred to me later on and when I was at John Peter Smith Hospital in Fort Worth that had been mauled by a rather angry, very mean kind of dog uh, and had to have 1,500 stitches and extensive surgery, reconstruction, and that kid had a aversion to uh, dogs that was pretty enduring and even affected things like picture books seeing a dog in a picture book and things like that. So we had to do uh, 
biofeedback, uh, and a systematic descent cessation procedure with biofeedback to gradually wean them off of and put that into extinction, uh, and because that was a really powerful aversion. Um, also, there's stimulus generalization. You know, it can not only be dogs, but maybe you know any other animal, uh, and they're also more sensitive to reconditioning once you get it extinguished. Like, you know, if they got around a dog and then it abruptly barked at them or frightened them, you could see a recurrence of the uh, aversion. So um, that's an example of one of the many types of aversions you can often see with uh, classically conditioned responses. Kind of jumped the gun here, but here's the uh, some details in uh, application of classical conditioning in a, a setting like a classroom setting. Uh, this also applies to parents as well. And uh, when I was in clinical practice, uh, you know, how we set up the uh, treatment room at the clinic uh, was to have certain kinds of colors and um, decorations in the room that would put people at ease at being in a therapeutic setting. Um, active classrooms with lots of changes, depending on how the age of the kid, you know, how long their attention spans are, really helps uh, make the place more um, appealing. Uh, and of course, snacks, food, anything like that that's allowed, whatever you can do in that kind of thing is always a primary reinforcer uh, or from a classical conditioning terms, it's always a source of pleasure that gets paired with this setting. Um, and the uh, and again, uh, avoiding anything like humiliation or fear or aversion. That's one of the downsides of overuse of punishers is that you can get conditioned aversions out of them. That's one of the side effects we'll talk about later. So a review of, review of B.F. Skinner we can look at operant conditioning or behavior analysis. Uh, most schools have what are called a what's called a behavior anal analyst, and that's a person that uh, helps do consults with kids and teachers to solve certain kinds of problems they're having, like behavioral problems and things like that. Uh, there was a lot of research done after Skinner formulated his model um, and published it, and several books and several hundred articles, and then. Uh, when Skinner got going there in the 60s and 70s, uh, the number of behavioral analysis programs in the country bloomed up. There was a, a behavioral medicine program at University of North Texas that uh, I did some training in, and there was a applied behavioral analysis program at UT Arlington. There's a, several um, uh, behavioral analysis programs nationwide. There's still some, no, not quite as many as there were then, but uh, it, it became a big topic because it gives you very specific tools for dealing with increasing and de de increasing desired behaviors and decreasing undesired behaviors. And uh, a lot of research that looked at the relationship, the difference between punishers and reinforcers and intrinsic reinforcers versus extrinsic reinforcers. And they discovered a lot of things that were really important in uh, in understanding human behavior. But uh, one of the really important things that Skinner did was he promoted the idea that psychology should be based on laboratory experimentation as its foundation, that we really should. Because at the time Skinner comes along, uh, Sigmund Freud is the primary theorist in the world when it came to uh, human mind. The, and Freud had some really progressive and, and interesting ideas but the problem with Freudian theory is, is uh, it's not scientific at all. And many of Freud's assumptions are not verifiable assumptions. So it's not an evidence-based approach. Uh, and it saddled us with some myths and misconceptions that we still live with today, that you can judge a person's cause of behavior based on their childhood. It turns out that a childhood is a very weak predictor of traits and behavior. Um, and that situational variables are much, much stronger predictors. Uh, an overemphasis on the idea of personality uh, and the whole idea of the unconscious as being the fundamental approach in psychology was undone by uh, the behaviorist. And 
So uh, Skinner and the, the de- there erupts this kind of debate between the psychoanalyst and the behaviorist. And the psychoanalyst pretty much won out because um, psychoanalysis is a topic of study, but it's, it's just not. Well, interestingly enough, it's still practiced sort of subtly, but it's not um, really our, our way of practice anymore. So we can look at operant conditioning through kind of a flow here. We have uh, the fundamental principles, and that is is that uh, in operant conditioning, a reinforcer is anything that follows a response that increases the frequency, intensity, or duration of that response. In other words, reinforcers strengthen behavior. A punisher is anything that follows a response that decreases the frequency, intensity, or duration of that response. In other words, punishers decrease the strength of responses. Okay, now what's important to keep in mind about reinforcers or punishers from an operant uh, perspective is that intention does not play a role in this. You could intend to be punishing and actually be reinforcing. So in the scientific version of this is we only know a consequence was a reinforcer if the behavior got stronger, which means we have to measure it. And we only know a punisher was a punisher if the behavior got weaker. So we have to measure. So... Uh, you, um, you find that you, you can intend to reinforce and you can think you're reinforcing and actually not be reinforcing and uh, vice versa for punish, punishers. So um, that was designed by Skinner to sort of lock psychology into an empirical design. You have to verify your assumptions with measurement and you can't make any uh, preconceptions. You have to uh, verify it with measurement. So in a way, operant conditioning is a post hoc analysis. You have a stimulus followed by a response, followed by a consequence, and then you look at what happened to the behavior. Did it get stronger? Okay, then that was a reinforcer. Did it get weaker? Okay, then that was a punisher. Okay, and so you're doing an, an analysis afterwards. Okay, uh, now, Positive reinforcers are just anything that follows a response that strengthens the response. Negative reinforcers, which is, are, this is a, a term that's easy to misconceive, but negative reinforcers are anything that, when removed, increases the strength of response. So uh, if, you, if something's going on and, you, and it makes you, and, and it's aversive for whatever reason, and you remove that aversion, then that behavior may get stronger. I'll give you a perfect example. You get a headache. You take a Tylenol. After you take the Tylenol, your headache goes away. What's the probability that you'll take a Tylenol next time you have a headache? It goes up. Why? Because your headache went away. Okay, Tylenol doesn't taste good. doesn't make you sexy. doesn't make you faster. Uh, all, all it does is take away your pain. Pain, not good. It's aversive. So if you take Tylenol and your pain goes away, then that is, you've been negatively reinforced for taking Tylenol, you're more likely to take Tylenol next time you have a pain. Same thing test, uh, uh, is true for escaping from a noxious, from a noxious stimulus or aversive stimulus, and that is, is that you uh, can be reinforced for engaging in a behavior that is, helps you escape from something that's unpleasant. Uh, and that becomes a negative reinforcer. That is actually what happens with drug addicts, okay? Uh, let's say you're a heroin addict. Why? Because you like heroin. So you start using heroin. You're injecting uh, um, an opioid drug, and your body is going to develop a tolerance to that, okay? It develops a tolerance to it because it won't, doesn't want you to take your pain away, and um, so it is going to try to reestablish that, that uh, pain sensitivity by making the drug less effective. The only problem is that's gonna throw you into withdrawal symptoms. So what causes a heroin addict to be so motivated to get more heroin? Because it feels good? No, because not having it feels really, really bad. So being sick because you can't get your heroin because you're in withdrawal sets you up to be be, uh, negatively reinforced when you do get some heroin and use it, okay? So, and when you do uh, use the heroin, then not only are you negative reinforced 
negative reinforced because it takes away your withdrawal symptoms, but you're positively reinforced because you get this giant wave of euphoria. So you get euphoria and your pain goes away. So that's why uh, certain addictive drugs are so incredibly addictive because they are both positive and negative reinforcers. So anything that's a positive and a negative reinforcer at the same time is going to be a very difficult behavior to avoid. Um, so uh, when Skinner developed this model, and there's a lot of details to it, but so again, take out the um, flow chart. You can kind of see how it works. I try to design the, the flow chart on the behavior analyst analysis uh, flow chart so that it, it made these things a little easy to contrast and compare. So here you can see how kind of the flow works. You have a stimulus, a response, and what we can substitute consequence there because that could be a punisher or a reinforcer. Okay. Now, a stimulus that stimulates a specific response is called a discriminative stimulus. Okay. In other words, it'll discriminate between any other response and that response. So it's a stimulus for a specific response. And then you have the response and then any consequence that follows that response, if it's a reinforcer, it's going to be reinforcing because it increased the strength of the response. Okay, this is where we need to talk about contingencies for a minute because I use that term quite a bit. A contingency is any direct link between a behavior and a consequence. So the consequence of that behavior is the contingency that behavior is under. So um, I won't get into that too much on an exam or anything, but I do mention, well, uh, uh, contingencies are the causal um, explanations for behavior under the operant model. So, but let's look at some things that, the, that they found in the research on operant theory, because this dispelled some myths. Um, but first, let's just look at the, the what, what was found. When they compared punishers to reinforcers, they found that um, uh, reinforcers are actually stronger than punishers at uh, changing behavior, uh, that it takes a, a much more intense punisher to change a behavior than reinforcers. They also found that naturally occurring consequences those consequences that are more logically connected to a behavior are much more effective than arbitrary consequences. So, and, and so let me bring back the contingency idea. What that means is, is that specific logical consequences for a behavior are, that means that those consequences, that that behavior is contingent, that it's in the context of that uh, consequence. Okay, it's a contingent. If the consequence is arbitrary, it doesn't logically have anything to do with the behavior. Like you're trying to get rid of a behavior, so you you try to implement some kind of a punisher for that behavior, but that punisher isn't a logical consequence of that behavior. It's an arbitrary consequence. Like, you know, spanking somebody with a bell for uh, being late or talking back. Um, the The... The spanking itself is not a logical consequence to the behavior, so that's why they don't tend to be all that effective. Um, and uh, so that's one of the reasons they found that, especially arbitrary punishers, which, by the way, in the criminal justice system, they're the masters of arbitrary punishment. I mean, a lot of punishers in the criminal justice system are completely arbitrary. They don't have anything to do with the behavior. And uh, so uh, that's why you see such high recidivism rates in the criminal justice system because they don't, and because in some cases they're just not able to, to uh, provide logical consequences. So let's look at what a logical consequence would be, for example, um, like how a parent can respond to a child's misbehavior, you know, disrespect. Um, children rely pretty heavily on their parents' attention. After all, you're going to die without them. So uh, that is, the child is. They have to be taken care of, okay? So if they're disrespectful and they don't, they don't treat their parent appropriately, distance by the parent can sometimes be a logical consequence to that. Like, 
what's what's technically a timeout, which is a true timeout, is when you withdraw social interaction. So the parent says, okay, and walks away. You know, you know they're going to need something pretty quick. And when they do, they go back to their parent with their need, like they're hungry or they want something. And the parent responds with, well, you aren't very nice to me, so I'm not feeling very charitable right now. So, you know, go away. Or say, you know, you have to, you have to make this right or fix it or say you're sorry or whatever. Two things are happening. One, they're providing a natural consequence for that behavior. And two, they're prompting a behavior they'd really like to see in its place, like apologizing. Uh, and so that's why behavior analysts tend to spend most of their time trying to find positive responses that uh, they can use in, in place of punishers. It was a really interesting principle that resulted in a sort of an expansion of operant theory into cognitive behaviorism and actually predated pa uh, Bandura a little bit. And that's called the PREMEC principle. Uh, and the whole idea was this. Uh, how could you use a desirable behavior, a desirable activity, to reinforce a less desirable activity? So in the PREMAC principle, uh, it's used in applied behavior analysis quite a bit, uh, is when someone is, is encouraged to do something that is a little less desirable by rewarding them with an activity that follows that's more desirable. And both of which, in many cases, are a positive behavior. So, uh, you know, being encouraged to, say, complete their homework so that they can go outside um, uh, and clean your room so that you can um, engage in some activity or have a snack or something like that. Uh, there can be downsides to the pre principle if it's not used right. Like, for example, you want your kid to like certain foods. If you try to reward food that they don't like as much with food that they do like, especially if the food they do like is really not that good for them, like sugary foods or dessert type foods. The problem you can get into is, is you, as you do that, you devaluate the primary uh, food, the one that you want them to like. You devaluate it because what happens is, is that they see the food that you think is good for them as less desirable as their is their condition to more and more see the uh, less nutritious food as desirable because that's the pattern you're reinforcing. Do eat your vegetables so that you can have cookies, which makes cookies even increasingly the reinforcer, and the vegetables are the work. And so uh, with premac, you have to be kind of careful about uh, using uh, that kind of reward because it can devaluate the action. Would, because what's the desire? I mean, the desire is you want them to like the things that are good for them, and you don't want to uh, risk that they'll even become less desirable because of their being, uh, it's being framed as work, and the whole idea that it's undesirable gets reinforced by the process. So let's look at some ideas about punishment and what and what under what conditions is, is punishment ineffective, and then we can look at under what conditions punishment is natural and, and more effective. I mean, punish by, punishment by nature is just simply an, an a Skinnerian operant term, and that is, is it's something that follows a response that decreases the intensity or duration of that response. So it, there's no value judgment about punishment. Uh, at an operant level, it's simply something that decreases the intensity of response. Sometimes that's natural, sometimes it's not, okay? When punishment is natural, it, uh, it is a, naturally, a natural aversive outcome, okay? So it can be part of the biological learning process. You know, uh, we're actually designed to be punished by certain things. You know, you take a bite of something that's spoiled or gone bad then that's an aversion, okay? So the consequence of eating that thing 
was to, uh, to experience an aversive response. So that's naturally punishing. What happens to the probability you're going to do that again? You're going to eat that thing again? It goes down. Okay, now you can look at it in Pavlovian terms and say, terms, Pavlovian terms and say it's a condi condition aversion, but you can also look at it in operant terms and say you were punished for engaging in that activity or, you, or, or eating that food. Um, so punishment, though, can be ineffective sometimes, and that has to do with um, the fact that it may not be natural, that it may not be a natural consequence. The more logically disconnected a, a consequence is from a behavior, the less effective it is as a punisher. And uh, the, the really quintessential example here is swatting a dog because they peed on the floor. Uh, and uh, we'll look at kids in a minute, but it's kind of interesting to see this. Why do programs like Man's Best Friend, dog training programs, they never use punishers. They don't swat them. They don't yell at them. Uh, they don't do provide any kind of version to them. The only time you see that is with shock collars, which teaches dogs where the perimeters are so that they don't violate the perimeter. They, it's called a, you know, it's an invisible fence at that point. And that is a, 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 an aversion. Uh, but in general, like if you're getting your dog trained, they don't use punishers with, with, in dog training because they are generally not that effective with dogs. And so let's say you want to train your dog to go outside to pee and you grab a newspaper, just like many of us were told, and the dog urinates on the floor and you love, you put their nose in the urine, and you give them a swat on the bottom and you throw them outside. Okay. What the dog experiences and what we experience are completely different things. For example, we have a logical sequence connected to that, you know, smell of urine. Uh-oh, shouldn't be there. I did something wrong. Somebody whacks me and yells at me and throws me outside. It's like I'm outside going, crap, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have peed on the floor. Dogs don't do that, okay? Because a dog doesn't have a conscious awareness like, oh, I need to pee. Where do I want to pee? Well, that looks like a good place. I'll pee over there. They don't have that. All they are is they're responding to the environment. So, for example, has there ever been any urine in the house before? They're going to choose that spot because they're going to mark it. But say there, is, there haven't. They'll just pick a pee and pee and a place and pee and they'll go over there and pee on the floor. Okay. You're not happy. You go over. When you push their nose into it, they're going to get a real strong smell of urine. Okay. Dogs have giant olfactory bulbs. Okay. They're going to have a big, strong smell of urine. So the dog's going to be, be, their experience is going to be, I smell urine. Okay. And then you smack them on the bottom of the newspaper and yell at them and the dog's brain goes to somebody's hitting me. And then they go into real intense distress. And then you throw them outside and they go squirrel and they're outside. Okay. They're in a totally different stimulus environment and they don't have any connection. Like they don't logically think, oh, I'm outside. I should be peeing out here. Okay. That's, they don't make that connection. So dogs don't have that tracking that goes from situation to situation that way. And that's because being swatted on the bottom with a newspaper is completely arbitrary. And when it's that arbitrary, it's non-contingent. So the dog doesn't make a contingent connection between the urine on the floor and uh, and going outside. Um, also, when they have fear, it shuts down attention and draws it inside. So in other words, they're not going to be attending to the environment at all. In fact, that's generally true with physical punishment is attention goes inside as it does with physical pain. You know, when you're in pain, you can't concentrate your brain turns in. That's why chronic pain causes depression. So um, so when's punishment effective? Well, that's when there's some sort of logical connection, you know, like, uh, you know, you've got a parent, your kid's in the kitchen, and they, uh, they put their hand up, you know, and they're reaching for a hot uh, skillet handle on the stove. Now, you could just wait for them to touch the handle. They'll get burned, and then they won't do that again. But you might be a parent and not want to have them burn their hand and all that. So instead, you just give them a swat on the hand and just say, that'll burn you and startle them. They're focused on the pan. They get startled. They don't get damaged in any way. That is basically a natu naturally occurring punisher. Somebody, you know, if they had the same response they would have had if they got burned. They have a startle response. It's scary. It reduces the probability they'll touch the pan again because they get that sense. Oh, this hurts. It's scary. 
or something like that. That's what, um, and so contextual logical punishers tend to be, have the potential to be effective. Arbitrary punishers, ritualistic spankings, things like that tend to be very ineffective and don't, and don't tend to have an effect on behavior. And this is actually why paddlings in school are, have been largely disguarded uh, by most school districts. See, it's all, all risk, no reward. Um, and uh, they were very ritualistic. And also paddlings in school tended to be pretty humiliating. And so kids would get spanked, you know, in the hallway and earshot of other kids and things like that. Uh, Sometimes teachers would swat kids in the hand with a ruler in class um, and things like that. But, and that's completely non-contingent. It rarely has anything to do at all with the misbehavior or the, uh, um, of the problem. And when the, when the spanking is completely arbitrary, it tends to be almost completely ineffective. Um, and this is a hard thing for a lot of people to buy because we live in a very punitive society. Our only um, method of control over behavior, uh, we jump right to the punishers. And uh, even though sometimes we can't avoid that, uh, it's not very effective. Uh, and so and there, it takes a, a little bit more creativity to come up with ways to uh, change behavior without using punishers. Now, that doesn't mean logical punishers are bad. I mean, there are consequences that actually a, a parent can, or a teacher, can kind of allow a negative consequence to occur. Kid doesn't study, they get a certain grade, uh, it's not a good grade, they have to suffer a consequence for their grade. To keep an ownership on them for that grade and that negative outcome is actually more effective because it's contingent. Contingency-based punishers, things that are logical consequences, do tend to be effective at changing or reducing behavior. And parents that do that are termed authoritative parents or logical parents. So um, authoritative teachers do the same thing. Uh, and so as kids get older, they develop verbal skills and you want to make them more responsible for their own behavior. Like, you know, you make them lunch and you want them to pick it up and take it to school. You don't want to have you know, over, uh, parents that over prompt tend to wind up with kids that are over dependent on the prompting. So it becomes this thing where the parent prompts more and more and the kid has to be prompted more and more. They won't uh, actually put their coat on and get ready to go out the door until the volume of the screaming to get it done gets to a certain point. So over time, the parent can actually be uh, trained to be more intense in their demand because the kid will ignore them until it gets to a certain level. And uh, so sometimes uh, with authoritative parents, they'll just kind of let a consequence, uh, uh, let, a, let a consequence happen, you know, and, and they forget to take their lunch. Well, you know, they don't get anything to eat that day. So, and it's when they, complain, then the parent would respond with, oh, wow, uh, I see you left your lunch on the cabinet on the counter. You must have been really hungry today. You'll probably remember to take it tomorrow. And uh, rather than admonishing them or reminding them, they don't need any reminding. They know they were hungry. They know they forgot their lunch. Uh, they know they didn't study and they did poorly on the test. Uh, and so if they make that connection, then that helps. Sometimes we get in the way of that by throwing a bunch of extra credit at them. The schools are the world's worst at this. And what we find in, uh, with extra credit is, is that test scores go down the more extra, extra credit you give. And so what that means is, is extra credit causes people to learn less and less. Um, so, um, and let's say your kid uses disrespectful language, you know, and, and the parent wants them to learn how to be socially appropriate and use the right kind of language. Language, And uh, so usually in that kind of setting, a naturally occurring response would be the response you'd get from anybody if you use disrespectful language with them. And that is you would lose social contact. People don't generally want to be around people that are disrespectful. It's also good to make a prompt for an apology, like withhold 
and social connection until they apologize and then reinforce them for apologizing. You know, give them uh, credit for that. Uh, it's not a good time to admonish them when they apologize because it teaches them not to apologize. You've probably known people that had an aversion to apologizing. They, they had been punished for apologizing because they would apologize and then they'd get, oh yeah, well, you know, you know, and then they, the, the parent gets, uh, gives them a dressing down after they apologize. That's not a good idea because they're doing something you want to reinforce. Apologizing, being able to apologize is a, a good thing. So the behaviorists came up with a interesting strategy because they, they, because they were concerned about the research was fine and the punishes are pretty weak for change in behavior. So they got to thinking, well, if, if reinforcers are stronger than punishers for change in behavior, how could we use reinforcers to get rid of behaviors we don't want? And so they started thinking about antecedents. That's the opposite. Like, what's the opposite of the behavior I'm trying to get rid of? Like, this kid's being disruptive. What's the opposite of being disruptive? Being cooperative and attentive. Uh, or this kid's being disrespectful. What's the opposite of being disrespectful? Well, being respectful and pleasant. Okay. And so uh, they decided to experiment with competing responses. So they would train parents, for example, or teachers to look for opportunities to reinforce. And that's the wording they would use. They say, okay, try not to attend to or put any uh, emphasis on the behavior that you don't want. Instead, either prompt or wait for a behavior you do want that competes with it and put your attention into that and try to eventually wean them off or eventually weaken that behavior by denying it, the, the unwanted behavior by denying it attention. And you can't have two conflicting behaviors occur at the same time. So over time, as the desirable behavior gets stronger, its antecedent or the undesirable behavior is going to naturally become weaker. So like the more cooperative the kid gets, the less disruptive they're naturally going to be just because your time is taken up being cooperative. Okay. So let's say you have a kid that's disruptive in the classroom. The teacher may actually prompt them to engage, to do something that, uh, that they, that, they could been, be, then be reinforced for. Um, and, uh, you know, even things like the, uh, a kid is asking you for something and they're doing it kind of a demanding, disrespectful way at home and you're, you're a parent, okay? Then you could, uh, I know one mom, for example, was real clever with this. Her kid uh, would demand, you know, would pop off and demand something and she simply totally ignored him. And he'd say, can't you hear me? And she'd say, not when you're talking like that. And then she'd just walk off. And so then, you know, he might kind of be petulant for a while, but he's going to need something eventually. Okay. And then that was her opportunity to say, you know, I only respond to certain things and that's not one of the things I respond to. So if you want my attention or you want something from me, then you're going to have to nice it up a bit. Uh, and I won't treat you that way. You don't treat me that way. And because that's the exchange theory that exists in nature. Uh, so, um, but behavior analysts do this all the time. They look for competing responses, try to strengthen that, and try to weaken the behaviors that you want to get rid of by using the competing responses to avoid having to use reinforcers. By, side, by the way, I've seen this in the juvenile delinquency world. Uh, I've seen big changes in kids when they were introduced into a contingency-based environment that were strong reinforcers for incompatible behaviors, behaviors that were incompatible with being uh, disruptive or violent or uh, they, uh, so they, they had a lot of success with uh, turning kids around when they put them in an environment where they, could, they had an opportunity to reinforce the desirable behaviors. And they naturally can't, you know, engage in the in unwanted behaviors. Another thing that was interesting was is intrinsic versus extrinsic reinforcers. This was another thing the behaviorists found, and that is, is intrinsic reinforcers are naturally occurring. They're a little more related to what are called primaries, like affection, achievement, mastery, comfort, uh, and of course, basic primary reinforcers like food, sex, and fun. Um, those uh, intrinsics are 
tend to be reinforced because they trigger internal responses like dopaminergic responses or natural needs. Extrinsic reinforcers are inconsistent. They're uh, referred to as tokens. They involve things like money, uh, trophies, uh, status objects, things like that. Uh, and extrinsic reinforcers are only reinforcing if they're linked somehow with intrinsics, like uh, like a, you know money will buy you what you need, like food or things like that. In that case, money becomes an uh, a important extrinsic reinforcer that gets you intrinsic reinforcement. But sometimes it becomes just a token economy itself, like money becomes the object where it's not getting you anything, it's just the accumulation of it or uh, prizes or, you know, it's interesting, but extrin and so uh, what's interesting is extrinsics sometimes lose their value, like the trophy you won for playing a sport in junior high may have little or no value to, this, to a person when they're an adult, you know, it's lost all of its extrinsic value. But this is what the behaviors discovered. They were discovered that when you look at intrinsic and extrinsic reinforcers, they compete with each other. And one of the ways they compete with each other is through a process called reinforcement shift. So reinforcement shift is when you start to reward with extrinsic reinforcers and it in fact begins to uh, de decrease the intensity of intrinsic reinforcement. And so the per person becomes more and more dependent on extrinsic reinforcers. So, um, the best example of this would be paying for grades. Let's say uh, your kid's making C's and you want them to make A's and B's, but they're performing at a level of C. And they're performing a level of C without any rewards. They're not getting money for it or anything like that. So you think, well, I'm going to pay them to make B's or A's, okay? So you'd be extrinsically reinforcing their uh, study behavior or whatever they have to do to make higher grades. Okay, this is the problem you're going to run into, and that is, is that their level of intrinsic reinforcements is sitting right there at about a C average. Okay, that's their intrinsic reinforcement level at that point. That's what they're willing to do to achieve to that level. If you start to extrinsically reinforce grade making, what can happen is, is you may see a temporary increase in the grades. You may see pop up to some B's and A's for the extrinsics. But then what begins to happen over time is, is that the effort becomes dependent on need. Like for example, if you need the money, you'll study more. But if you don't need the money, you don't have anything you need it for, or there's not anything, uh, you know, that, that they want, then the extrinsic reinforcement may have no value at that point. And so uh, it can, wind up just weakening the intrinsic reinforcement. So then what happens is, is grade making actually can get unstable and it can drop at, to below a C. And uh, so then they can you know, begin to have uh, uh, inconsistent performance that's low at a lower level than the performance they were having before. Um, and so, a better solution is to try to figure out how to pair uh, grade making behavior with other intrinsic reinforcers, like does having higher grades, uh, can you give signals that make them feel like there's mastery in that or achievement in that or attention or affection, you know, are they, getting more compliments as a result of it? Are they getting admitted to, you know, uh, getting reinforcement from a peer group? And all those things are intrinsic reinforcers. Uh, you know, like anytime a kid's acting, for example, to make their parents proud, you know, that's an, even though that's an external uh, motivator, it's still pretty intrinsic. So um, that's why behavior analysts often will try to avoid the use of extrinsics and it's also explained some things, you know, um, a lot of times when people begin to make a whole lot of money at an occupation of some kind, like athletes, musicians, things like that, 
they begin to have difficulty getting motivated because the intrinsic motivator that got them there, the say, for example, the, in, the motivation to be, a, be creative and create art or music or literature or the intrinsic motivator for an athlete to, to play better and be better at a sport can actually get weakened sometimes when there's too much extrinsic payoff for it. And then writers will report that you know, now they have writer's block when they're really in demand. Or musicians will report that it's hard to be creative anymore because now you're actually writing music to make more money. Or athletes will report it's really harder to get motivated to get into the gym because uh, they're actually just playing for the money at that point. Now, it's not true for all athletes or musicians or artists, but uh, it is a consideration. Um, and so that was the important finding when they started looking at uh, extrinsic and intrinsic reinforcers. And this, this is also uh, referred to as extrinsic and intrinsic motivators, too, in, in much of the literature. Now, we had Skinner, Skinner develop the operant theory, and behavior analysis just really took off. But then a debate emerged between Albert Bandura and B.F. Skinner. Bandura was of the mind that, uh, that not all learning happens as a post hoc kind of process, that uh, when Skinner was restricting the idea that expectation uh, and that, that cognitive processes are a part of the puzzle, uh, Bandura thought that was too restricting. So when Skinner said the only way you can know if a consequence is reinforcing is by measuring the effect it has on the behavior, Bandura said, we, but you can also anticipate that something will be in reinforcing and see that that behavior will get stronger before the reinforcers ever even elicited. Okay. And so Skinner said, well, how do you measure expectation? And Bandura said, well, you set up a obvious reinforcer, a pending reinforcer, and you let that, you know, you notify them that that's available in some way or another, stimulate them to know that there's a reinforcer available, watch their behavior increase and become uh, stronger before the reinforcer even takes place. And um, so when Bandura came up with that model, he was introducing cognitive uh, processes in with the operant theory, and, they, and that was termed social learning theory. So that made operant theory a much more powerful model. Behavior analysts now are basically social learning theorists. And that's because many, many more tools are available in the social learning theory model or the cognitive behavioral model. Uh, first of all, Bender talked about modeling, which is observation and imitation. He said and demonstrated in the laboratory that kids learn from imitating what they see. And he did some uh, well-known studies. They're, they're in your book. Uh, he did some well-known studies on aggression and showed that kids will model aggression. And uh, so that became our central theme. You know, that gets evoked many times when people start talking about the effect of TV violence on kids and, uh, or on society in general and things like that. Interestingly enough, it doesn't always turn out to be the case. People don't apparently model everything they see, and they don't tend to model things that are in the digital realm. So they're more likely to model, say, the behavior, a kid's more likely to model, for example, the, the behavior of their parents or their peers around them, not necessarily likely to model a character on television that's engaged in some kind of a task uh, for whatever reason. So there must be some sort of a barrier between the digital world and the natural world. Uh, Bendera talked about self-efficacy, introduced that idea, which is uh, a person's belief about their ability to perform a behavior. Uh, I talked about this a little bit before when I, uh, when I told you about, talked about Rotter, uh, but efficacy, actually you can use the term self-confidence in place of self-efficacy. But self-efficacy is a person's belief about their ability to perform. You know, what is their, how, how much do they anticipate that they can complete a task? This is a big deal because in the sports psychology literature, for example, 
Uh, one of the things you do in there is you train people to anticipate and expect the outcome of a behavior. Like a pitcher learns to anticipate that when they throw the ball, it's going to actually uh, enter the strike zone in a very specific location. And the more the pitcher expects that to happen, the higher their level of efficacy, the more likely it is to in fact happen. If a batter visualizes that when they swing the bat, they're going to hit the ball, they're much more likely to hit the ball. So they, so athletes are trained to raise their degree of self-efficacy and expectation to improve the probability that they're going to get the desired outcomes. So here's the basic argument with Skinner and Bandura, and that is, is that in the radical behaviorist model, that's Skinner's model, you have the stimulus in the environment, and then he had what was called the black box, and that's everything that goes on in the mind that you can't measure and observe. He included that uh, everything in the black box is things like expectation, emotion, motivation, cognition. That's all in the black box. Skinner said that's not accessible. There's no point in talking about that because you can't measure and observe it. And then you have the response or the behavior. So the stimulus, the response, and then you'd go on and put in the consequence uh, and how that's going to affect the, the behavior. But in the cognitive model, you have input from the environment, and then instead of a black box, you have a mediational process. That is the mental event that is the result of the stimulus environment. And then the behavior is the, is the product of that mediation, of that cognitive event in the middle. So let's say the input from the environment is an available or a stimulus to engage in a certain behavior, and then the mediation process is the expectation that if you do that behavior, you're going to get a certain outcome, like uh, it's going to pay off for you in some way. Then that's an expected reinforcer. So expectation would be a mediational process. Uh, another mediational process would be deterrence. Okay, so uh, deterrence is when an input from the environment says do this behavior, but then the mediational process says, yeah, but if you do, you're going to suffer a negative consequence. You're going to be punished for it, and that's called a deterrent. Uh, what's interesting is, is that deterrents tend to be weaker than expected reinforcers. So deterrence, that's why deterrence doesn't work all that well. Um, only if it's immediate does it actually work. So here's an example of, uh, this is Bandura's model, uh, actual images from his uh, modeling of aggression study, where uh, the, and the top you see here, these are the confederates. So the confederates are the experimenters. And then the bottom is the child imitating the confederate. So uh, they manipulate, this is what's called the independent variable measures on the top. That's what the confederate does. And what the child does observably on the bottom is the dependent variable. So you manipulate the, what the confederate does and you look at the effect it has on the child. And he found that you could reliably predict uh, the behavior by um, modifying what the confederate does. That's been used, these studies have been cited thousands of times in looking at uh, the way kids and people in general respond to observing behavior in the environment. Now, when Bandura talked about expectations of reinforcers, those are termed incentives. So programs based on incentives tend to be some of the most powerful change agents for behavior. Managing people by incentive is a much more powerful way to change, increase uh, the strength of a desired behavior than, than any other kind of approach. Uh, so you have incentives and deterrence. And deterrence are uh, actually the process of threatening and punishment. And deterrence, uh, as, as punishers are weaker than reinforcers, in, uh, punishers are much weaker than incentives are. So incentives actually tend to be very stable and pretty strong um, um, alterers or, or strong the changers of behavior, change agents for behavior. Um, so now when employers are working with their employees, uh, incentives, uh, consistent incentives tend to stabilize the workplace quite a bit, but they can't 
operate uh, ex in exclusion from extrinsics. So for example, employees have to get paid. If they're not getting paid enough, then the aversive emotional condition that results from not getting paid enough lowers the incentive value of the job itself. So that doesn't mean that if you tell somebody they're wonderful enough, you don't have to pay them. That won't work like that because there's also kind of an intrinsic incentive that comes from what your level of pay is. Okay, some, in other words, a person may see their level of pay as indicative of how valuable their employer thinks they are. And so it may go beyond just the extrinsic nature of getting paid. And getting paid or salary means something uh, to you know, socially to how valuable a person believes that, they're, um, that they are in a social setting. Athletes are big on this. They, you know, you wonder, you know, why would a person move their family and go crazy whenever, uh, you know, they get an offer for another million dollars over the $20 million they're already making when that has absolutely no effect on their lifestyle or anything like that. Uh, no effect on them extrinsically. It's, it doesn't add that much value to them because they're already so high up in the extrinsic reward. But when they see that figure, they tend to see that as this is my ranking in my sport for how what club i'm in who makes the kind of money that i'm making that and am i as valuable as other athletes and so that's why you see that mixing of an intrinsic uh, incentive to what's actually extrinsic reward so uh, uh we use levels of pay as a signal that puts us on a hierarchy as to how valuable we are. And that's a product of sort of the, the affective or emotional part of capitalism. So what's the evidence that deterrents are weak? If you look at the literature, what you find is, is that uh, in the uh, criminal justice literature is a good place to find where you see deterrent is to turn, efforts to change behavior, decrease behavior, eliminate behavior by deterrence are almost always a failure. The recidivism rate in adolescence in the criminal justice system is extremely high. If a, child, if a uh, teenager gets arrested and winds up in the detention center, the probability that they'll be back in the detention center is higher than any other criminal category. So, uh, there's been efforts over the years to use sentencing and uh, you know the death penalty and things like that to try to suppress unwanted behavior, like the drug sentences, for example, or what's called the habitual offender statute in Texas, where if you get three felonies, they declare you a habitual criminal and you get you know a, an ex essentially a life sentence. Uh, interestingly enough, though, when you crunch the numbers, none of these uh, the, these efforts to deter are actually all that effective. But for example, the death penalty had absolutely no effect on the homicide rate. When they reinstituted the death penalty in the 80s, the homicide rate continued to go up. It didn't have any effect on it at all. In states that have a death penalty and states that don't have a death penalty, you don't see the death penalty as being a factor in their violent crime rate. In fact, places that have the death penalty tend to have high, higher violent crime, but that doesn't mean that the death penalty is causing higher violent crime. It just tells you that the death penalty is not suppressing their violent crime. So, uh, and so that's uh, kind of predictable when you look at the research because punishers in general tend to be weaker than reinforcers. And so you would expect the deterrence uh, would be weaker than incentives, and they tend to be. Uh, they tend to be weaker, and they tend to be less stable. Uh, deterrence tends to be less stable. Also, escalating punishers, uh, you know, and this is a, a bad habit that schools are in, and it's a completely ineffective practice in the criminal justice system where a first offense gets you one uh, 
penalty. The second offense, it's much worse. The third offense is much worse. The idea is, is that you're piling up uh, penalties uh, to try to suppress. But obviously, it's not working because they are second offenders or they are third offenders. So what makes you think that making the thing that you did in the first offense worse is going to have any effect on the second offense or the third offense? And that's exactly what you find is, is that people don't commit their second felony, and they go, oh, that's it. Can't have a third felony because I'll get a life in prison, so I'm going to have to reform now. I mean, that just doesn't happen. And uh, it uh, doesn't happen with kids uh, in the, um, in the um, uh, juvenile justice system. The only thing that I've ever seen work in the juvenile justice system, because I did work in the juvenile justice system years ago, uh, the Tarrant County Conven uh, Detention Center, and I worked for CPS, for several years and what I found was is that if you couldn't find incentives then you were pretty much not going to make any progress so the problem with not having available incentives was the problem not we always had available to, uh, efforts to deter penalties are easy incentives are difficult especially for kids that are under resourced or, or institutions that are under resourced so um, uh, and that's exactly, you know, what they found in the research. So when is deterrence effective? Well, actually, incentives and deterrence are most effective when you have the shortest distance in time between the behavior and its consequence. So immediate consequences tend to, in general, have stronger effects on behavior than distant uh, consequences or delayed consequences. And now, since deterrence is necessarily weaker, uh, immediate uh, punishers are about the only way that a deterrent can take effect. So, for example, police officers know that uh, when, you know, uh, they're having traffic fines for going over the speed limit has absolutely no effect on, the, on speed limit violators. In fact, they raise the fines up now where they're so high, people actually... Uh, we'll just sit it out in jail because they can make more money sitting in jail than they can paying these enormous fines that they've accumulated. So they'll go sit in jail. <laughs> of course, then the sheriff has to let them out of jail because it's costing the county too much to keep them in jail. Police officers know that the only deterrence to speed speeding is not that you can tell them all day long, well, you're more likely to be killed in your car. You might like to hurt somebody else. You don't want to tear up your car. You know, uh, you're wasting gas, whatever. But the only real deterrent is to take your radar gun, point it right to smack at them, and then when they see it, then they'll slow down. And that's because the, they're getting a signal right there that they're about to get stopped. And so when you have no or a very short period of time between the behavior and its results, being observed is obvious to the offender, then deterrence tends to... Be a, uh, that's about the only what time deterrence is really effective. Uh, Julian Rotter came up with a really interesting addition to the pa to the Bandura model, and that was his uh, his view of locus control and expectancy. Um, now this is, actually is based on Bandura's model of self-efficacy, but Rotter invented a scale called the Rotter Locus Control Scale. Where he could, it asks people a variety of questions that they answer as true or false. And what it measures is the degree to which they are confident that they have control over contingencies in the environment. And so Rotter proposed that people that have a low level of efficacy, that they have uh, a low level of confidence that they have control over what happens to them, he referred to them as externals. And people that have a high level of confidence, that they have a, a high, a strong sense that they're in control of what happens to them, that they manage the contingencies in the environment, those people are referred to as internals. So then a whole explosion of studies resulted when Rotter came out with this model. And they, this is what they found. They found that internals tend to be optimistic, they have higher levels of self-efficacy or confidence, and they're more resilient. Uh, they're less prone to study and uh, suffering from anxiety or depressive uh, symptoms. Uh, externals tend to be cynical, 
or pessimistic, they have a lower level of confidence and they're less resilient under stress prone to mood or anxiety disorders. So, in other words, internals feel like they have a lot of control, externals feel like they have very little control. The good news about broader and the locus of control model is, is that this is a powerful change agent. It is not a personality trait. It's changeable. A person can be external on Rotter's uh, scale, but become more internal. In fact, psychotherapy techniques or success or achievement often shifts people from being externals to internals, as well as uh, self-monitoring their own language and uh, making an effort to make more optimistic statements and things like that can shift their perspective from being an external to an internal. So there's no advantage to being an external and having a pessimistic, cynical view. Uh, actually, uh, optimists have it all over pessimists. We see that in the health psychology literature when we find that optimists are less prone to heart disease and hypertension and, and uh, autoimmune conditions and, and pessimists and cynics tend to be much more prone to hypertension and and uh, depression and anxiety disorders and things like that. So, um, uh, so the question is, is you know, how what are, what's the change agent? How do you make that happen? Well, with kids, uh, it comes from them being in a contingency-based environment. That is, when kids are in situations where they can clearly see that their behavior is producing positive outcomes and they have opportunities consistently to have their behavior reflected as connected to the outcomes. In other words, they're getting complimented because they've been good at something or they're being successful because they've had some real achievements, some real signs of achievement. That their grades mean that they studied, uh, that their position on the on a sports team or in a you know in, in, a, in a musical group or something like that, their position in that is a direct consequence of their own behavior. Then they develop a high level of self-confidence and they become internals. And this is why extracurricular activities are so important in kids. We, see, we tend to devalue them as being less important than academics, but they're not. And that's why extracurricular activities like sports and music and theater have such a dramatic effect on kids' academic performance. That's why the top performers in any school tend to be the ones that are highly involved in extracurricular activities and have developed that sense of optimism and that high level of efficacy. And uh, that pays off in uh, then, you know, making that reality. Expectation becomes reality. Now let's look at somebody that's going to be one of the most important people that we study this semester, and that's Jean Piaget and his theory of cognitive development. We pretty much, what I recommend is, is that Piaget be put in the middle of all the models. Everything should be associated with Piaget. Even the myelination of the brain and basic neurophysiological development because Piaget outlines effectively how thinking develops. And, and thinking is the, the foundation and the prerequisite for all functioning. So that's, you know, language acquisition is based on this. Uh, arithmetic abilities are based on this. Ability to function in school uh, and uh, and, and executive function, the ability to elicit control over emotion, all based on uh, the foundation that Piaget uh, lays down. And he, he lays this down pretty effectively in a model of stages. So um, basically, thinking becomes much more sophisticated, much more abstract as kids uh, progress through the Piaget and models uh, or, or stages. And uh, with that, kids be, get better at proactive planning and they can control their emotions, delay gratification, and uh, think critically. That's uh, the signs of cognitive development. And so uh, that's why Piaget's model is so important. And Piaget's model really starts with some basic cognitive psychology, which is schema theory. And think of the schema as just a concept category. It's uh, the, it's, it's analogous to when you look at your computer, you've got file folders on it. And file folders are named. So you've got to name the folder. And then you name the folder some term that describes what goes in that folder. And then you put stuff in there. And then over time, you develop more and more folders. And then eventually, you may wind up putting folders in folders, 
you know, because otherwise you just have too many folders to go through. So you put folders and folders, and then you develop a kind of a Boolean hierarchy of concepts there. The first folder you go into is the most broad concept, and then inside of that are subconcepts in there or subcategories. And then you'll pick the ones closer to the, the, the exact one you want. And you go into that one, and then it has very specific examples in there of uh, what goes in that folder. And our brain kind of organizes that way in this, this kind of matrix of this schematic network that look a lot like the folders on a computer. So we organize our knowledge based on, uh, you know, descriptors. And uh, so that's the schematic structure. Um, and... So um, what Piaget describes is, you know, how kids develop, uh, children develop from the neonatal, from the beginning of infancy on up through early adulthood, how they develop the, uh, this system of understanding, storing, uh, retrieving information in, these, in this schematic network. So PSAJ's description of this is through a process called assimilation, accommodation, uh, and equilibration. And uh, so uh, assimilation is just a simply uh, the earliest form. So, so, you know, the one thing a child might have had, that one animal a child might have had contact with in their life is their pet dog. And usually the first word that gets associated with that uh, animal is doggy. So what a, that, they form their first schema. That first schema is going to be a furry, four-legged, non-human, because they know that that dog is not human, not like brother is, or, well, of course, there may be some doubts about brother, but mom and dad, they're humans, dog, not human. So that's a furry, four-legged, non-human, and that's the category. And so that is their very first uh, schema that they develop, okay? And then when they, so, you, you know, you put them in the car in the car seat, you're driving along and you see a cow on the side of the road. What are they going to say? Well, they're going to say doggy because that is a furry, four-legged, non-human. And that's the only schema they have. And at one point, you're going to say, no, cow. And the kid's going to go, cow. And then... What they've done is accommodated. They're going to build a new schema. Furry, four-legged, non-human, non-dog. Okay? Now we have the ability to discriminate there. And sure enough, the cow just ain't a dog. And the cow ain't a human either. And the dog's not a cow. And the dog's not a human. So that gives us uh, a couple of little categories here. Now, in my, keep in mind already... We have kind of a hierarchy here. We have humans and non-humans. And the non-humans have now two schemata in there, a doggy and a cow. So you're driving along, you see a horse. And of course, the kid's going to say what? Well, they're not going to say dog likely because a horse is much more like a cow than a dog. So, you know, the exemplar for uh, horse is cow. So they're going to say cow, at which point you're going to say no, horse. So then the kid has a new schema, okay? And then, you know, you go on and uh, they're assimilating and accommodating, assimilating and accommodating. Eventually it involves things like what cows do versus what do horses do. Uh, and it gets more complex. Now that complexity comes from the organization's network. So... First, they form a schematic network, and the schemas all have um, prototypes and, and um, in them that allow you to know what to put in that schema. Assimilation is actually just putting things in the schemata, so you can discriminate between the schemata. You find the exemplar or the prototype that it goes into, and uh, in other words, what's the example of a cow? Is this a cow? Yes, put it in there. Okay, what is a horse? This is a horse. Okay, put it in there. Different types of doggies. Maybe a little confusing when you get around Great Danes or, you know, you get quite a bit of range there. Anything from a Chihuahua to a Great Dane is considered a dog. Okay, 
uh, but they can do that. And then, they, and that's causes them to organize. So they start to organize. And these organizations become like Boolean hierarchies or hierarchical orders. So you have, uh, like I said, humans, non-humans. And then, you know, you get a sense or an intuitive sense for cows, horses belong in a category with some really unfamiliar animals like chickens uh, and pigs. Because in the process of kitty books and stories and nursery rhymes and things like that, they start to associate that those things belong in their own category called farm animals. You know, so they'll have like a larger schema that the smaller schematic categories can go into. And that's organization. So that gives them kind of the, you know, oh, well, these are things you would see on a farm. These are things you would see. You know, on a safari, these are things, you know, these are dinosaurs. You know, they're going to confuse, well, which dinosaur is most like a cow? It, they're going to have a broad category of dinosaurs and a lot, quite a range of what's going to be under that category of dinosaurs. And also, dinosaurs don't exist anymore, so they're mythical, you know. And uh, uh, not that they didn't ever exist. They did, but uh, you don't have currently living dinosaurs. Um, okay, so now... So let's look at Piaget's stages and get down to this, which is a little bit difficult because it's discriminating between one stage and another. I like to kind of make it a little more organized, but uh, the first stage is actually called the sensory motor stage. And if you just look at the word sensory motor, it tells you exactly what the stage is. It's the sensory motor stage is the stage where you have Sensory information in, in and motor out, and you don't have cognition in between. So uh, it occurs in the first couple of years of life, and this is when they're kind of coordinating motor responses, and they may have, you know, uh, uh, simple gestures and things like that. But basically, it's a period of out of sight, out of mind. In the sensory motor period, there's not a great deal of cognition going on. And whenever something's not in their sight, they don't have any sense that it still exists. So when mom leaves the room, mom doesn't exist anymore. So they won't look for mom. So like the way to test that is with a, a young child. And, and by the way, this is going to generally end way before two years old in most cases. So you have a little red rubber ball. You show them the ball. The kid looks at the ball. And you say ball. And the kid's looking at the ball. And then you put it behind you. And the kid doesn't look to see where the ball went. They just go on to the next thing. OK, they're in the sensory motor period. They don't have object permanence yet. If you take the ball and you show it to them, hey, look at the ball. And then you put it behind you and they look to see where it went. OK, now they're not in the sensory motor period anymore. They have mastered object permanence and they're on to the pre-operational thought stage, which takes you to the next stage. OK, in pre-operational thought, this is toddlers to preschoolers. Their thinking is basically... Um, Egocentric, they have difficulty taking the perspective of somebody else. Uh, they uh, don't think abstractly, uh, and they um, um, uh, they haven't decentered yet. So decentering allows them to um, see that you have a perspective different than theirs. So that's what the decentering is. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. And that's evidenced in tasks called conservation. Uh, there's some experiments that Piaget did to kind of demonstrate this. The next, and so as soon as they have begin to decenter and they master conservation, they're no longer in the preoperational thought stage. You know, when they can, uh, you know, tell that a tall cup uh, and a short fat bowl hold the same amount of water if you pour the cup in the bowl and the cup into the bowl, then they know that, you know, water can change shape without a change of volume. That's called conservation of volume. At that point, you're in the concrete operation stage. So in the concrete operation stage, they have actually fairly advanced, you know, these are school age kids and uh, they have fairly advanced ability to understand um, concepts, how things work, night physics, uh, and uh, quantities, uh, 
what they have some difficulty with, and they can do like hypothetical thinking. These are if-then kinds of problems. Like if this is true, then that's naturally true. They can kind of predict outcomes. Like if I do this task, then this is going to be the result. Uh, what they have difficulty with is, is uh, theoretical and abstract reasoning. Um, and so they may not get analogies. Uh, they may not quite get uh, certain examples. They may not understand like some kinds of humor uh, and they may not uh, be able to make inductive reasoning type tasks like associate concepts. And when they are able to do that, when they can engage in inductive reasoning and their uh, hypothetical thinking becomes more sophisticated, then they are in the formal operation stage. This is typical for kids and adolescents. Okay, let's look at memory. Memory is important because at this point you can look at how cognition, which is what Piaget was describing as you go through the Piaget and stages, you can see how cognition affects memory. As cognition becomes more sophisticated, so so it becomes more sophisticated their ability to remember. So and uh, and that has to do with uh, uh, the, their ability to elaborate. So let's look at uh, the action Schiffer model with elaborative rehearsal added to it. Uh, first of all, you have incoming information which is stimuli from the environment that's picked up by your sensory system. Sensory memory is just memory that stores uh, information from the environment into your sensory system long enough for you to attend to it. If you don't attend to it, it just goes away. So there's a lot of stimuli that your senses pick up that you never actually attend to. When you're driving your car along the road, you see a lot of things that you don't see actually. You don't remember those or incorporate them into anything. But if you do pay attention to it, and the stronger you pay attention to it, the, the better the signal, it goes into short-term memory. And short-term memory is also called working memory because this is where a lot of work is done. This is where you process memory and put it in a form where it can be stored so and understood. So there's this is where you work the information, associate with other concepts, gain insights, uh, and, and then uh, to actually to, to begin to form retrieval cues for permanent storage and retrieval, you elaborate. So elaboration means to think about it at a deeper level. It's also called deeper level processing and associate it with previously known information or uh, think about it in novel ways or even trying to explain it or come up with examples is part of elaborative rehearsal. So in elaborative rehearsal, the ways to enhance elaborative rehearsal are one, to talk about what you're thinking about because that causes you in the left frontal region of your brain, you tend to create language with it and that uh, provides for a lot of retrieval cues. Anytime you use a lot of senses with any kind of information like being actively involved in it, that involves some kind of tactile sense, uh, writing actually is a, is a, a tactile motor process. And I hear people sometimes talk about how we're going to do away with writing and substitute it with electronics and keyboards and cell phones. Uh, actually, there's a benefit to writing things down, drawing diagrams and things with nothing but a pen and a paper. It can really help if in elaborative rehearsal, teaching uh, something to somebody else or explaining something to somebody else causes you to process at a deeper level. So that's why you have told people that you actually learn as much from teaching somebody else something as you, uh, as they learn when you teach it to them. So because uh, being taught is a relatively passive thing, teaching is a very cognitively active process. So when kids do activities together and they uh, engage the information at a deeper level, that, that helps them build more elaborate retrieval cues. And that's what stores it in long-term memory. So the better your retrieval cues are, the better your uh, retrieval from long-term memory will be. Also, anything that's personally relevant, like connected to your own experience or your own history, uh, that goes into your um, uh, episodic memory, your autobiographical memory.
And that is pretty much automatically stored. So that's why personally relevant information or details are much easier. Experiences are much easier to store than uh, more arbitrary types of information or semantic facts. And so when you've lived a, a process in some way or another, that's why, you know, when you want to learn biology, you go to biology lab too. Biology labs where you do dissections and you examine things uh, in a real physical kind of interactive environment. And that's what um, really drives that information in and makes it uh, usable and retrievable. So like I said, there's a connection between cognitive development and Piaget and memory. And so uh, memory uh, encoding and what was discovered, you know, and by Axon and Schifrin in the elaborative rehearsal model shows that uh, the deeper a person, what the capability a person has to engage information at a deeper level or understanding at a deeper level understand it at a deeper level really dramatically affects their ability to memorize. And so um, that's why, you know, the more you know, the easier it is to know more. And that's why knowledge base, and there's a lot being written about that right now, is that the cue, the, the, the uh, um, ability to be educated is uh, directly related to the ability to accumulate knowledge. And so the more knowledge a person accumulates, the more context they have, the easier it is to remember things. So the things you already know about, it's much easier to put new information in that topic area than something that you have absolutely no background in. And so that's why you, uh, you know, to become educated in the details in a certain area like engineering or something like that requires a lot of basic study in physics and math and some things like that. Why you learn gross anatomy to become a doctor is not because you're going to need to know where the hook of hamate bone is in a person in your clinical practice in all probability. It's because the process of memorizing all that stuff lays down a pretty significant foundation for places to put new information. Lots of schematic networks involved in there. Um, so the more we know, the easier it is to know more. Um, now, decentering in Piaget in terms or abstract reasoning in Piaget in terms really helps us deepen our processing. So that's why memory tends to improve as a person proceeds through the Piaget in stages. The better, the, the more, uh, their abstract reasoning ability improves, the more decentering they get, uh, the, uh, they get, uh, they, they, you see an improvement in their ability to store information uh, and build uh, a uh, schematic network of, inf of retrieval. The, 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 their ability to utilize the information improves dramatically. Another area we're going to get into is psychosocial development. And very, really, and one of the first ideas about social development came from a Russian developmental psychologist named Lev Vygotsky. And Lev Vygotsky was really looking at how kids learn from other people or um, their parents or caregivers or trainers. And so he developed this kind of process that he was looking at and how kids uh, acquire skills through, through sociocultural socio theory. And sociocultural theory is based on the idea of the zone of proximal development. So it's kind of simple. Uh, Lev Vygotsky believed that, you know, at first a kid's trying to acquire a skill, they don't have the ability to complete the task. So what happens is, is that they get assistance from somebody else who does have the skill. So that person uh, actually lends the skill to them until they can complete the task with some assistance, with, with the most assistance. And then over time, as they acquire that skill, the teacher or trainer starts to remove their efforts until the child's completely autonomous in the task. And those uh, levels that they withdraw in are called scaffolds. So uh, 
I did examples as a kid learned to ride bicycles. So there's a kid that got a bicycle, you put them on the bicycle, you grab the handlebars, you run along with them, and you're balancing them and navigating for them. And they're pushing the pedals and getting the bike going. But they don't have the ability to balance the bike at that point. So you're providing all the balance and all the ability to actually do the task of riding a bike with a person's, the parent's or trainer's assistance. And then what happens is, is you let go of the handlebars for a few seconds or a second. And they actually manage to kind of get a feel for it until they start to lose control. And then you grab the handlebars again and reestablish control. And they keep going and then you release it again for just a, a, a brief period until they start to lose control and you grab the handlebars again. And over time, the time you're spent holding on to the handlebars decreases and the time they're spent doing it uh, by themselves increases until you transfer the skill from you to them. The zone of proximal development shifts from the trainer to the trainee, and then the trainee becomes actually functionally autonomous. Now this happens at, at all levels. We, we do it with their language. We help them complete their statements until they can eventually get an intuitive sense for how to create language of their own. Uh, we do it in the social environment. Little babies don't manage it in their own space. But as they get a little bit older, then the amount of space they can manage for themselves gets bigger. So they, they can play around in the living room and kind of get around in there without having to be, you know, pinned up in a playpen or something. Eventually, they can go anywhere in the house. And then they can go to a fenced-in yard. And then eventually, they can run down the street and play with their friends before long, they're, you know, on a bicycle riding off to the pool or they're uh, driving a car when they get to be in adolescence. So the amount of control they have, the territory they can manage, gets bigger and bigger and bigger as the zone of proximal development shifts from maximum supervision to relatively minimum supervision. And that's uh, how Vygotsky explained the social relationship and development. And you can also see Vygotsky's model in a broader social context as well. Um, for example, how schools are structured. In, in preschool, kids manage very little of their own space, and their day is pretty highly structured. And, the, and uh, so they don't make a lot of choices for themselves. And uh, they basically exist in a room, and the teacher... They, they will most likely have one or two teachers for an entire uh, time period there. So they won't be changing classrooms or any of that, and they won't be responsible for the kinds of things that the older kids are. So in that situation, the teacher has and the environment is set up to be basically in maximum control. Uh, even going to the, you know, by the time they get to kindergarten, going to the cafeteria is this kind of process, you know, they... They've got to go line up in the hall and they stand there and it's don't move till we're ready to go. And then it's pretty structured and how, because, you know, otherwise it would just be very chaotic because their executive function is not, not that great and they're uh, needing to be managed a bit. But then you see this kind of transition as they go through elementary school. And by the time they get to junior high, uh, generally for most school districts, sixth, seventh grade, they start changing classes. They have a locker. They're responsible for managing that little five-minute period when they have to get to class. And kids find that to be kind of stressful at first because it's a lot of responsibility and it's a little bit chaotic and they're not too sure of themselves. So for the first few days of the school year, the young ones, you know, the little, uh, the ones that are beginning to change classes and all that, find uh, this whole transition between classes to be a little bit of a challenge. And, uh, but then pretty soon, you know, they manage that and it becomes second nature. And, and that's the way these broader social environments, you know, that's why the laws and rules apply differently based on age. You know, what, what we expect kids to be able to do varies quite a bit by age until they get up into adolescence. And then there's this transition from the expectations, you know, of being a young, uh, an adolescent to a young adult. And, uh, and that's usually the transition off to their senior year in high school is sort of that zone between uh, taking total control and when, you know, now and when they go to college or into a career. Now, Erie Bronfenbrenner had a really interesting model called ecological system theory. 
and he uh, lays out this this kind of uh, concentric systems uh, and that of uh, concentric systems of influence and you and what the way you can look at this is is that the systems take priority differently or directness or indirectness differently depending on what the age is so for example in the very middle you have a person and then at when they're really young and they're in school and they have to be taken care of and all that their micro system is what they're most directly exposed to and uh and then the other influences the microsystem is their immediate family and their caregivers, the people that actually have proximity to them and the home that they live in. So that's in their microsystem. Now, the microsystem has maximum influence and effect on them when they're very, very young because they don't see the other concentric systems outside of that uh, as much. Mainly, it's the influences from that central system. And then as you go out from that, uh, you get to neighborhood and school, and they, they begin to start to experience that. In fact, uh, at some point, their, their mesosystem there where the school is and things like that are going to have probably as much effect on them as the microsystem, so as their family and stuff, because they're highly involved for significant amounts of time in school and in their neighborhood. So then they're exposed to those kinds of influences. And then the exosystem goes on out from there, and that's uh, the uh, um, community services and, and television and mass media and the kind of social uh, situation they're in based on what their parents do for a living. And uh, those are more indirect influences primarily, uh, with some exceptions. But... Uh, and so they don't, uh, generally children don't experience those as directly, adults uh, somewhat more. And then the macro system is the whole kind of broad cultural values, beliefs, customs, religion, the laws that you, you live under. Those are for most people uh, mostly indirect. And they, uh, and, and so the way Bromfield's model works is the macro system has effects on, has an effect on the exosystem. And the macrosystem and exosystem have effects on the mesosystem, and then those three systems have an effect on the microsystem. So uh, even though all of the effects are in play, the person's contact with those effects varies depending on what they do and how they're connected and what their age is. Now, another theory that's going to be increasingly important to us when we get into the midlife, late life and the aging process is competence, environmental press and performance. Uh, this was a theory developed to look at uh, the balance, the effect that environmental press, that is the level of challenge in the environment has on an individual's ability and sense of resilience, which is their competence. So uh, they looked at different ways that, uh, you know, environmental press, uh, that is, how that, that when the environment's highly challenging, what effect does that have on competence? And what is, effect does uh, their comfort level or their performance level, how's that affected by the balance between competence and environmental press? So, for example, uh, if a per person is highly competent, but they have a fairly easy situation they're in, then that means environmental press is, is uh, equal to or lower than their competence level. And so when environmental press and competence are about equal or competence is a little higher than environmental press, that's the zone of maximum comfort, uh, which may not be the zone of maximal performance potential. Actually, the zone of maximum performance potential is when um, their uh, environmental press, I mean, when their competence is somewhat higher than environmental press. And uh, so uh, then, uh, so the outcome of this is to, to kind of explain how there's a, a certain amount of need for environmental press to push competence to its maximum potential. So to make this a little bit easier, let's just look at the children 
uh, when children, as children grow, when um, em environmental press is slightly higher than their abilities, then that pushes them, their performance level up. So a certain amount of positive stress or um, withdrawal of, reform, you know, having them more functionally independent or having to struggle a bit raises their uh, performance. Now, uh, what's interesting is, is that when that happens, it also internalizes their locus of control and raises their level of efficacy. So um, that's why kids can actually be in situations where they're too comfortable. They're too taken care of. Those are called indulgent parents. And paradoxically, kids that are over-parented like that or they're overindulged tend to have lower levels of confidence and, and uh, efficacy. And so uh, and even though you know, and they function normally, they don't function at as high a level as they could and they're not as resilient as they could be. This is even more important in late life because people can get to the point in late life where they're going for too much of the comfort zone. They're not pushing themselves enough out of the comfort zone to keep their performance level up because now they're in a, in a situation not of improving performance, but of maintaining their performance. These are called IADLs or instrumental activities of daily living. So in lay life, it's, you can look at societies where, you know, the elderly have to actually maintain some ability to get around and do things for themselves. And those people tend to live longer and they tend to have higher, uh, a more delayed functional uh, age, which means that they are younger for their age. And uh, so it's not uh, bad to have actually some challenges as a person gets older. Uh, I read one article where they were talking about uh, the idea that stairs are bad and that if you get older, you have to get rid of the two-story house because it has stairs and all that kind of stuff. And this author, who's a gerontologist, was challenging that notion saying that, no, actually having to go up a set of stairs, as long as it's safe, Having to go up a set of stairs is a good thing. It's uh, uh, because in an, el in an older person, that's a workout. Uh, also, there's a lot of evidence that inflammation levels start going up after about 20 uh, minutes of being sedentary. So anything that cues a person to keep moving, uh, that adds to the environmental press and keeps their optimal performance. Um, uh, that keeps their performance at optimal. Now, in the study of lifespan and human development, there are certain principles that are important in the literature. And that is how development and aging proceed. Because you're actually developing all the way from conception up until early adulthood. We're on an upward slope, we're gaining skills, we're developing, we get past adolescence, and we get peaked out somewhere in early adulthood where our aptitudes are at their very highest and our functionality is meeting its maximum. And that's when there's going to be some changes and then the aging process starts. Now, that doesn't mean that a person doesn't continue to develop. It just means that they're going to start to age at that point. So some processes are going to continue to grow while other crop processes are going to start to decline. And uh, the, we're going to talk later about um, the difference between fluid and crystallized intelligence because uh, we don't actually get dumber with age, uh, but we, do, we don't get faster either. So our aptitudes don't necessarily go up, but our uh, crystallized intelligence or expertise does. So expertise tends to compensate for, for a loss of aptitude as a person ages. And what that means is, is that Aging is multi-directional, that you don't, all, not all of the processes in functionality go the same direction. They don't all go up or all go down. Some go up, some go down. Plasticity is a degree of flexibility and ability to gain new skills. That's related to fluid intelligence, but it's also related to the ability to gain new physical skills. The more placid we are, 
the uh, quicker we can incorporate new information, gain new skills, learn to do new things. Now, before age five, you have a critical period for certain things where neuroplasticity is the highest, and that is your ability to gain new motor skills, to lay down new motor pathways, to acquire language versus learn it, um, and your ability to recover from brain disease um, or head injury or physical injuries. Uh, all those things uh, are much greater under age five when a person's in development. And neuroplasticity and generalized plasticity is really high. Now, plasticity maintains itself. It it's, continues to be pretty high all the way through childhood until you get into early adulthood. When plasticity starts to decline as you get through adulthood, but certain aspects of class, plasticity will decline after age five, after your brain's myelinated and it's all kind of established and its level of functionality. So that's why gymnasts tend to start before age five. That is, you know, Olympic gymnasts, uh, concert violinists before age five. You know, if you talk to people in an orchestra, almost virtually all of them started playing before age five. So these people, athletes, baseball players, people like that, that have these exceptional abilities, uh, you know, you can see the effects of those exceptional abilities in these very early starters. You know? So that's why it's important to have structured PE and access to arts and music and a variety of what are called extracurricular activities in very young children because you never know what their interests are going to be. And some of the foundation for the things that they may want to wind up doing later need to be laid down at a very early age. And so uh, that's um, what's important about neuroplasticity. Um, so one of the things that uh, is remarkable in infants in the brain or children under five in the brain is the prognosis for recovery for a variety of brain disorders like cancer of the brain and uh, surgery to remove it, neurosurgery or uh, a blow to the head, a brain injury or a birth uh, trauma injury to the brain that would be caused by hypoxia or uh, you know some abnormality during gestation. The ability to recover from those things is, is dramatically different, and it's harder to make a prognosis uh, exactly to know what their recovery capabilities are going to be. So a young child under age five pulled out of a cold swim pool after 10, 15 minutes underwater may still have a reasonable probability or, pro or prognosis for recovery if they're immediately taken into care, put in intensive care and induced coma and all the things they do for kids with brain injuries at a very early age. Whereas, you know, if a person's 25 or 30 and you pull them out of a cold pool after 15 minutes underwater, you're not likely to even be able to get vital signs at that point. So uh, the things that, the point is, is that in neuroplasticity, the things that make a gymnast extraordinary because they started before age five also makes a child uh, have a much, much better prognosis if they have to have like a you know, unilateral hemispherectomy because they have intractable epilepsy or they have to have a brain tumor taken out or they get bonked in the head real good and hard and they damage the brain. That tendency to not know what their capability of recovery is because it's hard to form a prognosis in somebody that young is exactly the same process that makes these kids that at two years old are already swinging a baseball bat you know, play like super champions in the um, in Major League Baseball, you know, years later when they're in their early 20s and uh, and they're, you know, playing and uh, they started uh, introducing kids to sports at a much earlier age. And now we have these incredible athletes, you know, at 13, 14, 15 years old, they're already playing uh, dramatically better than their uh, than the kids did years ago. So the good news about crystallized intelligence and the kind of, uh, you know, warning sign is, is that fluid intelligence is your uh, aptitude period. So it's, of course, fluid intelligence is the greatest when you're young. Uh, it tends to improve as you go through childhood. 
because you know you go through the PJN stages, your fluid intelligence is going to improve, aptitudes improve, and uh, because your ability to process and cognitive abilities get better. And then you're going to reach a peak sometime in early adulthood, okay? And then you start having some declines in the speed of processing, the fluid intelligence, how fast you can get information into uh, storage and how fast you can utilize it. Uh, so what that means is, is that there's an opportunity cost when we don't have rich cognitive environments for kids when their fluid intelligence is at its greatest. So when someone's aptitudes are at, it, at their greatest, which is going to be somewhere in high school, that's when actually the cognitive workload needs to be at its absolute max. That's when you pour it on. In our uh, public education system, we tend to see a pretty significant backing off of the educational demands in kids that are juniors and seniors in high school. Many high school seniors are only taking maybe one or two classes a day and spending the rest of the day working at a job or something like that, uh, except in the top performers, the honor students, the busy kids, the athletes, many of them are much, much busier. And, uh, you know, especially when they're involved in things like theater and they're memorizing scripts or they're involved in, in, in music competitions and they're learning and learning, you know, uh, to go to contest and debate team and um, the sports teams, you know, uh, pra uh, const uh, practice and discipline and all that stuff. Uh, when they really pour it on, they accumulate an a lot of knowledge because the bandwidth for getting new information into the brain when fluid intelligence is at its greatest is uh, dramatic. And so if nothing's going on, that aptitude is not going to hang around. Fluid intelligence is going to decline. And so then you can have a loss of opportunity. So a person you know, works at a menial job or they don't really focus much on their education or the education system really lightens up on them and they load them down with too many ridiculous tasks and, and there's not a lot of demand to, to accumulate knowledge, then they're going to lose that opportunity because their fluid intelligence can start to decline. So what makes crystallized intelligence work is getting the data in there when aptitudes are high. So if someone, when their aptitudes are really high, is really a cognitive hard worker, they gain a lot of skills in a lot of different areas. When they start getting older and they're crystallized and they become more dependent on their expertise and their experience and their crystallized intelligence, they're going to harvest all of that knowledge that they accumulated when their aptitudes were really high. So, you know, how does a 40-year-old baseball player continue to play in the major leagues? Because they gained a lot of intuitive sense for the game and skills when their aptitudes were extremely high. If, if somebody decided they want to play in the, NBA, in the major leagues at 35 and just practiced eight hours a day until they were 40, they would never ever be good enough to actually come close because they've lost the opportunities gone. And the same things with academic pursuits. So even though crystallized intelligence improves in late life, if there's no knowledge base, there's also not a lot of aptitude for gaining a lot of knowledge base.